Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Sorry about that. And Radio Free Mormon, you're muted. I forgot to take the... Uh, the I want <laughs> to get that out of the way early on there tonight. You go. And get the you're okay. muted. Yes, that was a rather abrupt end to the applause is what I was saying. But good evening, everybody, to Mormonism Live. Hello, Maven. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Recovering is going well. So I'm glad to hear that. Does everybody... I mean, you're saying recovery. Do you want to go into that at all? I mean, I was mentioned before, but I had surgery on my foot, so that's why the uh, green screen background, and I've been looking a little funny the past couple of weeks, um, if people didn't know. I, th right. I feel like and I, just I made a reference up. to it, I think, two weeks ago, which I probably shouldn't have done, about don't look at you because there's nothing unusual about you. What is that <laughs> green screen doing for you right now and for the past two weeks, by the way? It's just letting me put my other background up and it's hiding um the hospital bed that i have set up in my room <laughs> that i'm laying in and that you're lying on right now as you're podcasting right yeah i mean it's it's reclined up a bit more than it was that first week that that was it our hundredth episode I, I know it was a rough time it was, it was two <laughs> weeks ago yeah i shouldn't have done that episode and uh i um I mean, I, I think everything was fine, but I just really wasn't all the way there. Um, I do remember there was somebody in the comments that I got frustrated with and I called them an idiot. And uh, <laughs> I just love that I, I, I don't usually do that. So I love that I got called out. Somebody, there were a few people that were like, oh, come on, Maven, you know, <laughs> you don't need to do the ad hominem. And, um, but, you know, which I appreciate. I, I think true friends are ones that will do that for you when you're not behaving the way you should. Um, at the same time, yeah, I. I wasn't really myself, but I also do not regret uh, banning that person. Uh, so current Maven and drugged Maven were on the same page there. So anyway, but it's, I just thought it was you know, sometimes calling somebody an idiot isn't an ad hominem. It's just a passing observation. There you go. I, I was still speaking truth. So there it is. But I'm really glad, really glad that uh, it's out in the open now about you uh, broadcasting from your hospital bed. Because I want everybody to know that you had your surgery on your foot. That was the mm -hmm. Monday before the 100th episode on Wednesday, correct? Yeah. Yeah, two days after serious foot surgery, Maven is such a trooper that she's here on the show pulling the levers and doing everything that she does in order to make this show run smoothly. So thank well you for that. I don't I don't know that if I should be praised for that, though, I, I feel like I probably should have just taken the the night off. But which is kind of why I don't if people remember this at the end. Um, I don't actually I don't think it was the 100th anniversary one. It was the one right before that. Um, actually, I was I was more present for the 100th anniversary one where we were going over all of our our favorite episodes. Um, so I think it was for the uh, the trial, the 1826 trial. Um, okay, so the 99th episode. That, in my opinion, which I hadn't planned on coming on. And so it was just a moment of pure, genuine confusion. So that's when like, I put up the t-shirt winner because I, I I knew you wanted something, and I but I didn't know <laughs> what you wanted. That's all I had. And so Bill was like, I don't you think we need clicking things. <laughs> yeah, so it was fine. It was fine. You're yeah. doing great. But by the way, we also got a great show tonight. Yes. Tonight's show yes. is called... The Greatest Problem in the LDS Church. And this is episode 102 of Mormonism Live. Tonight is November 16th, 2022. And we're pleased to have on the show Mr. James Bennett. And there he is. Here Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for dressing up for the show. Well, yeah. Same same on your end. I'm wearing my... <laughs> I'm wearing my killer's shirt. 
you know, I got this at the Killers concert here this last month. So That's very nice. And I see you're wearing pants tonight. I am wearing pants. I, I have done been known to do these things uh, sans pants, but uh, this time I thought I'd really class it up for, for my Radio Free Mormon debut. Well, you can see I have my Daredevil T-shirt yeah. on. I don't know if anybody guessed that in the live chat. That was a bit of a, a curveball. It's blue and it's Daredevil. Now, Maven or Jim, do you know what Daredevil's favorite quote is? Uh, the blonde. <laughs> I already talked about it before we went live, so actually they do know what it is. It's uh, actually, I'm trying none to is so blind. Yeah. None is so blind as he who will not see. That's right. And I, and I pointed out great Daredevil is a, is a believing and faithful Catholic, which makes him set him apart, I think, from a lot of the superheroes, is that he has a very rich spiritual life. Yeah, he's unusual in a lot of ways. And no, I'm not going to dignify that question of whether I have pants on with an answer. Not dignifying that at all. I think that oh. provides the answer we're all looking for. <laughs> Let's just say it's a little breezy here in the underground bunker tonight. <laughs> anyway, we're going to get to this eventually. Yep. I'm we gonna are going to go to. You guys get started. But yeah, I'll, we I'll might as well get started. What the heck? Um, we so are going to get to the here? biggest. Well, I'm sorry. Maven's not here. So I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Maven left because she has to take care of a lot of things oh, okay. behind the scenes mostly with our sometimes rambunctious live chat. Okay. So she's got to ban people and upgrade people and call them idiots and things like that. That's her job. Perfect. No, she does a great job. Anyway, before we get to the single greatest problem in the church, I want you to tell a story that has to do with the Midnight Mormons, because I know that it was a year ago, or maybe you can tell us when it was, that uh, you were a guest on the Midnight Mormons show right is that correct yeah uh it was it was I, it's i think it's almost two years ago um when i first met them uh they were called to my attention because they had done a uh a youtube show called this is the show t-i-t-s uh, yes you know, and you know what that spells don't you jim i i don't i don't you'll have to point that out for me uh, <laughs> I used to live in Jackson, Wyoming, and do you know what Grand Tetons means? Uh, I've heard, yes. It's, it's French. Pretty, it's pretty much the same thing. Only Yes, grand. it was like uh, the TITS show was like the Grand Tetons without the Grand. That's exactly right. Well, Exactly. The, but the TITS show was designed to uh, tear apart the CES letter, and it was really just it was just really obnoxious. I mean, they did this as sort of a, a foam newscast thing, and they had people dressed up as like Lindsay Hansen Park and, and, and you know, they were just making fun of people and it was just snarky and nasty and awful. And, but the thing that made me very uncomfortable is that they kept quoting me throughout the whole thing. You know, because I you did a response to the CES letter. Right, right. I, I wrote my response to the CES letter and they kept referring to it and they kept quoting me and they kept citing me. And I kept getting messages from people saying, did you have anything to do with this? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, I'm kind of embarrassed by it. And I'm embarrassed by how it highlights just how snarky my reply was. Uh, right. And I posted something on social media saying, I don't like this. I think it's kind of obnoxious. And a mutual friend put me in touch with Brad Whitbeck, who put me in touch with Cardin Ellis, who is the the lead Midnight Mormon, and, and Cardin said, hey, we'll fly you down to Los Angeles and you can take us to task. And I went, okay, that sounds fun. And so I they went- they flew you down to Los Angeles for that episode? They did. We filmed it in Cardin's garage. Was it first class? That's what I want to know. It wasn't first class, but it was- Those cheapskates. No, it was nice. I, they put me up in a nice hotel. It, it was oh, really? actually really- Really fun weekend. I and I got to know these guys. I had never met any of them before, and mm -hmm. we had a nice weekend together. But but uh, the first thing we did is we sat down. Oh, there it is. There's this is the show, and the first thing we did is we sat down. And Cardin said, "All right, lay into me, bro." And uh, I very pleasantly, I hope, uh, no voices were raised, nothing was thrown, but I sort of took him to task for what I thought were the excesses and problems of the this is the show 
And, and my, my central thesis was, look, if you have to make fun of Jeremy Runnels, uh, it shows you really don't have much of an argument. Uh, because if you take out Jeremy Runnels, it doesn't, it doesn't change the issues that Jeremy Runnels raised in the CES letter. And it, it makes you look weak. It makes you look like you don't have a strong enough position that's defensible. And, uh, and I remember the, 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 the most heated moment in that was Quake who came back and said, what you're saying is like, uh, it, it's the same as saying, well, I won't take out this Al Qaeda member because another Al Qaeda member will just crop up in his place. And I said, that's a terrible, terrible example. And uh, that was probably the most heated it got. Uh, Did John but, come uh, up in that discussion you had? I'm sorry? Did John DeLynn also come up in that discussion you John had? John DeLynn did come up. I, I, I called John DeLynn my friend, which I, I consider John DeLynn to be my friend. And uh, I said, look, you, you don't have to. I don't understand why we have to hate people who leave the church and why we have to demonize people who oppose the church. Uh, I don't understand why we can't continue to talk to them. I mean, I've been criticized. I had somebody on Facebook say, you're going on RFM? Why? And I said, well, my answer, first answer was, well, because he asked me. And my second answer is I enjoy, I, I like RFM and I enjoy talking to him. And I, I don't understand how it's helpful to the church to avoid talking, engaging with people who are critical of the church. I, I, I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. And, uh, and so we talked about that and we talked about, you know, in their show, they had John DeLynn as the devil. They had a little snippet. Oh, right, right. John DeLynn had the horns and everything. And they said, oh, that was only on screen for half a second. It wasn't a big deal. And then we talked about the meme where uh, they, they took it from the Inglorious Bastards movie where mm -hmm. you have the Nazi hunters pounding on the Nazis and the one guy's crying in the corner. They're, they're hitting him with a baseball bat. It's very violent. And they labeled the guy being pummeled as John DeLynn and the guy crying in the corner is Jeremy Runnels. And they insist, right. well, that wasn't a big deal because we didn't make that meme. We just retweeted it. Right. And I said, and I, that that's, that's obnoxious. It, 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 I don't see how that builds the kingdom. I don't see how that defends the faith, but anyway, uh, so we had, we had a really great discussion. And after we were done, they said, well, you're here for the weekend. Let's do some more of these. And I went, uh, okay. And we talked about the Book of Mormon. We talked about uh, uh, a number of things. I, we talked, I think, about some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. But the, the thing that was frustrating is that they released all of the video of all of the later sessions. But that video where I took them to task is still somewhere in the, in the vault in Cardin's garage, I guess. So they didn't release that part of the video. They released a snippet of it because I, I, I brought up two things that were that really frustrated me because one of the things they said, well, the, it wasn't just that this is the show. After this is the show came out, there was a Midnight Mormons episode where they took me to task and, and ripped me in absentia and said, Jim Bennett is a, is a naive boomer who, who just doesn't get it. <laughs> and, uh, when you and, said boomer, I know that you're quoting them accurately. Yeah, yeah. And that that really just ticked me off. I mean, I may be a coot, but I'm solidly Gen X. I'm a Gen X coot. I'm not a boomer coot. And and uh, so that was, I think that's the first thing I said to, to Cardin when he called me. Is I said, I'm not a boomer. And, uh, you know, he thought that was great. But uh, the other thing was um, Kwaku was talking about, yeah, well, his daughter keeps trying to hook up with me on Mutual. And, Wait a second. Kwaku said on this podcast, without you. Yeah. Okay. Without you, roasting you in absentia, that your daughter is trying to hook up with Kwaku on on what? Facebook? On Mutual, which is the 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 Mormon uh, the Mormon Tinder. Oh. It's a, it's an app where members of the church can can hook up and date and have wholesome activities, I suppose. I'm sure. Uh, but uh uh, and I brought that up with my daughter who said, I've never been on mutual. I don't have a mutual account and he's full of crap. And so the first thing that I said at the beginning of the episode was, 
I want to call you out, Kwaku, because my daughter doesn't have a mutual account and she's not trying to hook up with you. And Kwaku responded by saying, well, isn't your daughter, and he knew my daughter's name and it made me kind of look foolish, like, oh, okay, well, if you know her name, well, I, I'll have to go back and talk to her again. And that's the snippet they released. It's the, is Jim Bennett's daughter trying to date Kwaku? And so oh you can gosh. find that online. That's out there. And that was maybe the first 30 seconds or first minute or so of, of the, that discussion, which ended up getting into more hard hitting stuff as we went on. But the rest of it, uh, I, I would very much like to see them release that. I don't know that that's, I, I think that's a productive discussion that would be helpful to people. Well, let's do that right now. Let's call out uh, the Midnight Mormons and challenge them. I challenge you, I promise you. <laughs> I challenge you that if you release this video, this about a half hour long video that you're suppressing, where Jim Bennett calls you out, that you will feel blessed for that. You'll be blessed for that if you tell the truth. Because what it tells me is not only do, do they not want to hear what you have to say to them in this regard, they don't want anybody else to hear you say what you well, said. And, well, and, and I think, I mean, that makes it sound a whole lot more dramatic than I think the actual video is. Uh, you know, once it's released, people will go, oh, that was it? I, mean, I gave you the most heated exchange in it, but most of it was, mm -hmm. was I think, very reasonable. And, you know, it, people are a whole lot nicer when you show up, right? It's a whole yeah. lot easier to trash people when they're not around and when they actually show up when I'm sitting in the room with them. Uh, they were a whole lot nicer to me. I think I was a whole lot nicer to them than I would have been in, uh, in, um, you know, than I was in my in my rants before I actually met them. Well, I understand that because you should hear what I say about you behind your back. Uh, well, well, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I think Maven. No, as as we, we've got some listening devices. She's recording that and is going to send that to me. After this. Is okay, over. good. Good. Okay, so we've got that covered, that wonderful story, which otherwise we wouldn't know about if left to the Midnight Mormons to tell us because they're not going to tell us about it. Well, However, and I want to make make it clear that I like those guys. I mean, I, I've, I've been on their show uh, after that experience uh, remotely. And, uh, I, you know, I went to the, your debate with them where, where I thought you acquitted yourself very, very well. I, I, I thought it was very difficult for a three-headed monster to take on one RFM. They weren't coherent in terms of their ability to, to synthesize their message, and you had a clear, simple message in reply. So I think that worked to their disadvantage on that case. Oh, I'm no, too nice, you. Dan Vogel says. Sorry, Dan. So yeah. but I, I like Dan Vogel. I've never met Dan Vogel, but I, I like his work. I trust that that is one of the sentences that nobody's going to hear on judgment day what you're too nice you're too nice <laughs> yeah I, I think that is not going to be heard on judgment day so you are very very nice man i appreciate you i appreciate you because i know that you spent hours talking with bill real and then hours talking with john delenn about basically every issue of any controversy right within the church and you're a person who has thought deeply about your faith and you are well, let's put it this way. You're willing to come on a podcast and talk about your faith. And also you don't engage in a lot of apologetic maneuvers, which are designed to dodge the issue, which I've seen with others. I don't see that with you, but now setting this up. Oh, and the other thing I want to say about you is that you're a member of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, exactly. You've got it. I actually so, was are, admitted to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, at least on Mormon Tabernacle Choir stationary, uh, right. before the name change. So it works. Right. Do you sing soprano or alto? Both at the same time. I, I'm actually a second tenor. People ask me, do you know so-and-so in the choir? And I always ask, well, are they a tall second tenor? Because if they're not, I have no interaction with them. They're on the other side of the room, and I'm standing in the back. But if they're a tall second tenor, I probably know them pretty well. Well, I had this interesting experience during last general conference, and I think I can't remember which session it was, but you were singing in the choir yes. during general conference. I mean, that's what the choir does in addition to other things. But I had texted you 
during general conference just to see if you were awake. And I said, <laughs> I dare you to pull President Nelson's chair out from under him when he goes to sit down. And I was absolutely delighted that you texted back, at least with a ha ha on yeah. that while general conference was still going on. Well, you know, I'm limited by how I can respond because you can't pull out your phone when you're sitting there in the dark because it, it's way too bright. But I do have my mm -hmm. Apple Watch. Yes. So what I'm sure I did is I looked at your message and I just pressed the ha-ha emoji and off it went. But uh, well, that's I thought it was I great. Do. I thought it was absolutely great that a member of the, oh, what is it? The, the temple, uh, the squire temple at Square the Square Choir at the Tabernacle Temple. Choir at Temple Square. Thank Tabernacle you. That a choir member of that choir was at Temple at Temple Square. That a member of that choir was texting Radio Free Mormon during General <laughs> Conference. I thought that was fantastic. So now, without too much further buildup, I want to say so everybody knows the setup for this. This is not my idea for the show. That actually, this is something that you feel so strongly about that you wanted to talk about this on tonight's show. And I think the first time you broached this was with me was several months ago, and it's taken a while for us to get our schedules together and get you on. Right. So go ahead. I'll let you introduce what you feel is the biggest problem in the LDS church in the way you wish. Okay. Well, my sister asked me on Facebook, all right, so what is it? And I said, tune in and find out. And she, she guessed that it was snails. Somebody else guessed that it was dandruff. I said dandruff is number four, uh, tied with the heartbreak of psoriasis. So, uh, but uh, no, from my perspective, and I think you and I have a different label for it, or I think yes. your label actually, um, and I, I want to talk about that as we go forward, but I think the biggest problem uh, in the church today is the false doctrine of prophetic infallibility. You know, the old joke, Catholics say the Pope is infallible and no one believes it, whereas the Mormons say the prophet is fallible and no one believes it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that 90% of people's problems with the church or people's problems in a faith crisis are mitigated by the ability to say a prophet can be wrong. A prophet can make a mistake. Uh, and... And we talk about it in very vague sort of general terms. Uh, the most explicit, I think I've heard it, is when President then President Uchtdorf uh, actually said, there are times when leaders have simply made mistakes. And, and you know, Jeff Holland at one point said, uh, you know, the Lord has always had to deal with imperfect people. The Lord has always had imperfect people leading his church. It must be frustrating, but he deals with it. You know, and we talk about this this possibility of error, this possibility of fallibility in, in the broadest possible terms. But when it comes to actually identifying an actual error or an actual mistake, um, we, we refuse to do that. And we function as if uh, the, those mistakes are not possible. And one of the interesting thing that, that I did before we started I went to uh, to to uh, fairlatterdaysaints.org, uh, where they have a question: Can a prophet make mistakes? And there's a quote in it that I really quite like, but they frame it in an interesting way that I think is is somewhat problematic. They say they answer yes, a prophet can make mistakes. I say this statement does not mean that the Lord's servants are perfect, or that they will never make mistakes, display weaknesses, sometimes be irritable have bad breath, or display the characteristics of old age. And that feeds into what I like to call the limited fallibility model. Uh, you know, we say, oh, yeah, 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 prophets are fallible. They can, they can forget your birthday. They can, you know, spell your name wrong. But when they stand up at the pulpit in general conference, uh, their free agency is drained out of them and they are possessed a la Linda Blair and the exorcist. And they are channeling the voice of the Lord and nothing they say can possibly be wrong. And this gets into, I think, your label for what this is. Uh, you talk Do about- I get to introduce that? Yeah, yeah, you talk about- I'll tell you what it is. Fallibility, but you, what, you, what, do you, what do you call it? By the way, your mother cooks socks in hell. My, my mother what? 
That's a line from The Exorcist. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. No, that's a it line from the Saturday Night Live version of The Exorcist. Yes, it's just changed a little bit for prime that's time. That's Ray Newman. That's not Linda Blair. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, anyway, yeah, there's a whole idea about infallibility. And what I thought not too long ago, but I came up with this realization that if you're talking about prophetic infallibility, then you get caught up in this whole side argument, which sometimes is intentional, sometimes not, in order to avoid addressing the issue. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah, they can have bad breath. They could have dandruff. They can have psoriasis, blah, blah, blah. They could like Diet Coke better than Diet Pepsi, any kind of an error. But what I say is, I frame it this way, that Mormonism and the leaders teach that the prophet and all 15 really prophets are doctrinally inerrant or doctrinally inerrant, however you want to say it. And I, when I put it that way, it gets rid of the infallibility side argument, because I think when I frame it that way, we're saying what it is that we're talking about. And I've never met a faithful Latter-day Saint who has quibbled with that definition, uh, that they're I, doctrinally I, inerrant. Oh, so, so you've never met a faithful Latter-day Saint that doesn't believe that the prophet is doctrinally inerrant? Right, because that's what they teach us, and that's pretty much what the members believe, is that they are inerrant when it comes to pronouncing doctrine. Yep. I mean, if they're not, then there's going to be trouble right here in River City. Well, I'm seeing some of the quotes here, too. Uh, and people are saying, geez, it's terrifying. Uh, you know, I, my mission president was Joseph Fielding McConkey, and, and uh, son of Bruce R., grandson of Joseph Fielding Smith. Yeah. And uh, he used to say, so at what point does infallibility begin? Uh, why don't we have infallible bishops? Why don't we have infallible stake presidents? Uh, at what point do we presuppose that they are no longer capable of a, a doctrinal? In, uh, I mean, bishops stand up at the pulpit and uh, many of them say things that are not doctrinally correct on occasion. Uh, you know, does that mean we can't we can't trust our bishops? You know, the, uh, doctors uh, make mistakes. Does that mean that we shouldn't trust our doctors? Uh, it, I mean, the, the the idea for me, the idea is so problematic because we we are, we are one of the fundamental core doctrines of the church is the doctrine of agency. The, the whole purpose of mortality is for us to walk by faith and exercise our agency. And the one thing that the Lord will never do is interfere with the agency of humanity. And so uh, in order for someone to be infallible or inerrant, they have to have their agency extracted from them. They can't, uh, in, in, in order for Russell Nelson to stand at a pulpit and not be capable of doing something wrong, that choice, that agency, not to, or saying something wrong, saying something doctrinally errant, that choice has to be extracted from them. And, and see, the difficulty is that when we preach this, when we preach this idea, or we imply it, because we we, we very seldom, you know, put a name to it. Uh, we, we, we do all this couching of, oh, no, no, we know they're fallible. We know they sometimes have bad breath. But we, we raise up the expectation that, well, they're, they're never going to lead us astray. And I want to talk about that, that quote. And also the idea that whether by my own voice or the voice of my servants, this is, it is the same, which I think is the most fundamentally misunderstood scripture in the church. Well, um, if you'll hang on just a second, because I know you're winging it. I've got a little uh, outline over here. Which all right, sorry. Help you. So, if we can go to maybe your mission, and I understand that you have a relative that some of us have right. heard of. His name's David O. McKay or somebody. David O. McKay is my great-grandfather. Uh, Heber J. Grant is my other great-grandfather. How come uh, you're not a GA? Uh, well, probably because I go on Radio Free Mormon. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so That's going to scotch the deal right there. That's going to scotch the deal right there. Uh, okay, no, go ahead. Tell us your story when you're on your mission. Well, when I, when I was on my mission, so so I grew up, just, just a little bit of background. I grew up under the weight of that kind of an expectation. Uh, you know, my parents would always talk about David O. and Heber J. with this kind of reverence that made me feel ridiculously inadequate. 
I thought, well, geez, they're prophets. They're, what would they think of me if they met me, this dumb pud kid who doesn't know what he's doing? Uh, you know, it, it made me feel a lot like a failure. Uh, I was called on a mission to Scotland, which is where the McKays are from, and I was actually assigned to serve in Thurso, Scotland, which is right near the northernmost point of the British mainland. It's right at the very top of the island, and there's nothing up there but cows and a handful of people. And there were tiny, tiny branch up there. There were three people who came to church every week. And my mission president even said, we're putting up you there, putting you up there for six months. You don't get any baptisms. We're, we're closing down the area. And so one of the ideas was, okay, I'm a descendant of David O. McKay. The, the McKays came from Thurso, Scotland. That's where the McKays are from. And I thought, why don't we put on some kind of public sort of lecture where I can talk about it? At the time, my grandfather was writing a book about his father, David O. McKay. The book was called My Father, David O. McKay. And, uh, and, and so my mission president, I wasn't allowed to call home and ask for this, but my mission president called home and got them to send me a bunch of the source material that my grandfather was using for his book, including a copy of David O. McKay's missionary journal. David O. McKay also served his mission in Scotland. And you, you hear the story in general conference where he talked about, oh, I was kind of discouraged. And then I saw on a church, this placard that said, whate'er thou art, act well thy part. And that's when my mission turned around and I devoted my life to the Lord. And that's a lovely, uh, you know, sentence or two that works in general conference, but reading his actual journal, uh, I was, I confess, delighted to discover that David O. McKay was just as, goofy a kid as I was as a missionary. I mean, he, uh, he, he was frustrated. He said, I'd as sooner die than as distribute tracts. That's where tracting come from is giving out gospel tracts. And uh, he talked about an old woman that ripped up a, uh, a tract because she thought he'd set a gas bill and threw it in her face. And she was, she was a haggard woman, you know, I mean, he's, and, and, and he would take days off and tour whiskey factories while he was on his mission and I mean, it, it didn't seem to be the, the rule book, the white handbook didn't seem to be in effect when he was a missionary years and years ago. And the other thing that I discovered is he didn't baptize anybody on his mission. Part of that was that he had been pulled into mission leadership relatively early in his mission. So he didn't spend a lot of time proselytizing. Uh, but, uh, but reading that and seeing that lifted this huge weight off of my shoulders because growing up, I thought, well, geez, what chance do I have? Uh, but now it was like, geez, if David O. McKay can go from that to David O. McKay, <laughs> there's hope for Jim Bennett. And, and I decided at that point in my life that we don't do anybody any favors by deifying these men, by, by pretending that these men are perfect, uh, that they're great people. And, uh, I, uh, I mean, they are, I think they are great people, but they are people. And, you know, that, that was just a huge, huge revelation to me. And, and, and so this is the other story and, and you'll push back on this. Cause I know you've got a quote from Harold B. Lee. Right. You found out that, uh, even leaders of the church, they put on their garments one leg at a time. Uh, I don't put my garments on one leg at a time. I just jump right into them. <laughs> So you're never supposed to take them off. Huh? Uh, and never mind. Go ahead. I never have. Go ahead. I, I, the I, next I story. That once. I've never taken them off since. Um, okay, go ahead. Well, so my father, uh, my fa my uncle at one point used to write priesthood manuals for the church. And his um his his sponsor, I guess, or his supervisor in the Quorum of the Twelve was Richard L. Evans, uh, who was, I think, the last general authority to have a mustache and nothing else. Uh, but Richard L. Evans uh, would take my uncle's priesthood manuals and look at them and say, these are great. And then he'd take them to Harold B. Lee, who was the head of the correlation committee. And Harold B. Lee would say, no, no, change this, delete that, don't do this, do this, the other. And they go back and forth and really frustrated my uncle to see all these disagreements in the Quorum of the Twelve. And he'd say, look, aren't these guys prophet seers and revelators? Why are they disagreeing over whether this is great or whether it isn't. 
And then Joseph Fielding Smith became president of the church, and he thought, this guy can barely complete a sentence. He's 95 years old. Uh, I, and he ended up leaving the church. And uh, I don't know what the circumstance was, but my father found himself in the lobby of the then Hotel Utah, what is now the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, and sitting with Harold B. Lee. And this and is Harold, your dad's brother who left the church. This is my dad's brother who left the church. Okay. But my dad was sitting with Harold B. Lee. I don't think Harold B. Lee was president of the church yet. I, th he, I think he was president of the Quorum of the Twelve. Uh, and this was before my dad was in any way notable. He wasn't he wasn't a senator at the time or anything like that. Uh, and uh, he just said, and Harold B. Lee said, whatever happened with your brother? And my dad explained all that. And he said that Harold B. Lee got visibly angry and said, oh, for heaven's sakes, doesn't he know we're just men? He says, we're doing the best we can. But he says, that's a terrible reason to leave the church. And my dad told me that story, and I sort of leaned into that. But uh, you pointed out, and I think you're right, that that contradicts some of the things that Harold B. Lee said publicly. Do you have that quote there? I do. This is from General Conference back in October of 1970. Now, we cannot play the clip because, unfortunately, the church website only goes back to 1971 oh. with their General Conference addresses. Otherwise, we would play this clip. Now, I will go ahead and read it to you verbatim as it appeared in the conference report, though. And... Compare and contrast, if you will, Jim, what Harold B. Lee told your dad versus what he told the church in 1970. Now, by the way, 1970, he would have been the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at that time. And I think Joseph Fielding Smith would have been president for almost a full year at that point. David O. McKay having passed away in 19, January of 1970. January of 70, uh-huh. Yeah. This is Harold B. Lee. Now, the only safety we have as members of this church is to do exactly what the Lord said to the church in that day when the church was organized. We must learn to give heed to the words and commandments that the Lord shall give through his prophet as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. There he's quoting from Doctrine and Covenants. There will be some things that take patience and faith. You may not like what comes from the authority of the church. It may contradict your political views. It may contradict your social views. It may interfere with some of your social life. But if you listen to these things as if from the mouth of the Lord himself, with patience and faith, the promise is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. He went on to say in the same address, your safety and ours depends upon whether or not we follow the ones whom the Lord has placed to preside over his church. He knows whom he wants to preside over this church and he will make no mistake. He concludes, let's keep our eye on the president of the church. So it strikes me and I'm going to say this as respectfully as I can, that comparing those two statements, Harold B. Lee seems a bit two-faced in that he's saying one thing to the church publicly, but a very different thing in a private comment and conversation with your dad. What do you think about that? Um, I, think, I think you're correct to a certain degree. Uh, looking at that statement and rereading it while you were reading it, uh, I think Harold B. Lee publicly is framing the issue in the way that it is often framed when it's presented, almost always framed when it is presented in conference. Uh, and, and I think that there is a way to navigate uh, the distance between those two personas in that I don't think they're entirely contradictory. Uh, I think that, that there is tension between them, certainly. Uh, but I, I think it goes to, I mean, he quotes the Doctrine and Covenants in there about in all patience and faith. Uh, the scripture that I referenced earlier, uh, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same, is often one that is cited in a similar context. And, and that's section one, isn't it? The preface? Section one, the preface. Yeah. But what's interesting about that scripture is that uh, 
it's always ripped way out of the context from which the Lord actually gives it. Because section one flies in the face of any idea of doctrinal inerrancy. It, it talks about if they err, it will be made manifest. It talks about how he speaks to the servants in their weakness. Uh, it, it, it talks it repeatedly emphasizes the fact that these guys uh, are not perfect people and they're not inerrant people. The, it uses the word err. If they err, it will be made manifest. Uh, mm-hmm. And and so if you read that whole verse, because that's only a section of that verse, it says, you know, what I the Lord hath spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself, and it will all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. In other words, what the Lord speaks, oh, well done. Did I quote it right? It's great. Okay, good. Maven, you're great. Though the heavens and the earth shall pass, my word shall not pass away, but all shall, shall all be fulfilled, whether by thine own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. In other words, everything that the Lord speaks through his servants will be fulfilled. Not everything my servants say is exactly what the Lord would say at all times, which is the way we interpret it. And so I understand. If, well, well, if I was you gonna say, it, I understand your interpretation. I think it's very interesting. Would you agree with me, though, that this verse is brought up frequently in general conference, but it's not brought up in such a way as to support your interpretation, but rather the counter interpretation that whatever they say is from God? Correct. You're right. And so I also want to say this. we got another couple of clips, which are going to be fun, from President Nelson and his wife, Wendy. Okay. Um, but... Having read the Harold B. Lee quote, I know you'll, I think you'll agree with me on this, that this idea that the leaders are doctrinally inerrant isn't something the members came up with on their own. It's something that has been taught constantly and prominently by top leaders of the church for as long as I've been a member. And I joined back in 1978. I was back. No, I, no, I was baptized in 76. Um, no, I, I, the, the, if you if you read the actual quote by Harold B. Lee, it's couched in the same idea of the words and the commandments that come from the prophets. Uh, those are those are inerrant. Uh, when the prophet is speaking for the Lord, I mean, you you could take that. You're a lawyer, and you could take that and parse that down to the point where you could send a court of law. No, 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 no. I never ever said. We give heed to the words and commandments that the Lord shall give through the prophet. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything that comes through the prophet is the words and commandments of the Lord. I, I, I recognize the hairs I'm splitting there, but I think that Harold B. Lee recognized the hairs he's splitting there too. Uh, well, given the fact this was in 1970 that Harold B. Lee said this, and that he talks about following what the prophet and leaders of the church say that it may contradict your political views and your social views. I have to think that at least part of what he's addressing is the priesthood ban on blacks, which was still in full force and effect and quite controversial in 1970. Right. I think you're probably right. I think Harold B. Lee was one of the most intransigent apostles opposed to lifting the priesthood ban by all accounts I've read. Uh, So that that, that may very well be the context here. Sure. And yet the Lord allowed him to become the prophet. Right. Okay. I, I mean, he kind of cut him short. It was like a year, right? Uh, yeah, he was not prophet for very long. Uh, Maybe this talk is what did it to him. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I want to... I'm kidding, I wanna, Chris. Uh, you know... I, 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 I was going to say I was kidding because President Nelson has said similar things, and he's still going strong. Right, right. Um, you know, I, I look at, I mean, we can get into the priesthood ban specifically, although I think that that, that's a really lengthy discussion, but you know, when people talk about, well, geez, how on earth could you allow, what could the Lord allow a prophet, uh, to be a racist, uh, particularly, I mean, Harold B. Lee's got nothing on Brigham Young. I mean, Brigham Young said some truly horrific things about race, particularly, talking about the idea that the law of God is that, uh, you know, an interracial couple uh, should be, the, the law of God is that they should be put to death on the spot. And this will always be so, 
right? And and if you insist that a prophet is doctrinally inerrant, or is she searching for that? I'm no. not exactly sure. I'm getting uh, motion sick. There we go. Uh, but uh, if if you can't look at that and say Brigham Young was wrong, uh, and you have to find some kind of way to mentally justify that kind of garbage, uh, you, you're going to you're going to have to leave the church. I think. Oh, and let me read this out loud because some people will be listening to this only on audio later, Jim. Okay. I have to make a verbal record of it. What Maven has found is Discourses of Brigham Young, page 137. This is a really interesting quote to me because I have always heard the other quote from Brigham Young about how his greatest fear is that the saints will just allow their leaders to go on and lead them without ever questioning or asking God if what they're doing is correct, right? You've heard that one, right? Yeah. But here... He seems to offer a different sentiment where he says, quote, or I should say open quote. <laughs> close, close quote, sure. Oh, brother. The Lord Almighty, this is Brigham Young. The Lord Almighty leads this church and he will never suffer you to be led astray if you are found doing your duty. You may go home and sleep as sweetly as a babe in its mother's arms as to any danger of your leaders leading you astray. For if they should try to do so, the Lord would, would quickly sweep them from the earth. Right. Close quote. Close quote. Well done. Why aren't yeah, you a general it, authority? Why am I not a general authority? I turned it down, actually. Oh, good. Well, you know. I turned uh, it down. My, my principles wouldn't allow me to accept the call. So let me share with you another quote from Brigham Young. Uh, and Maven, I don't know if you'll be able to follow. So I didn't prep you on this one. Um, oh, Cardinalis. What the heck was that? Did you just have an idea, Jim? No, that was Cardinalis texting me saying LOL. So there we go. You know, Cardinalis is my favorite of the three. Is he? He's a I good guy. He's, I think he's a nice guy. I think he's funny. I think he tries to be fair. And I know a lot of people like, um, oh, who's the who's the, the guy? Uh, uh, it's Brad Whitbeck, right? Yeah. People generally like him best. But as I've watched him, over you know over time uh i don't trust him <laughs> i don't think he's as nice as he seems to be but i think Cardin's kind of the real deal well i think up close and personal all three of them are really good guys uh and and Cardin Cardin is as genuine a guy as they come i mean he he's showing you this is who he is for better or for worse he's yeah. up front there it is i'm this is who i am like it lump it but you know he doesn't hold anything back, and he's the same off camera as he is on camera. And I, I, so, I, think I appreciate authenticity. Yeah, yeah, and I think Cardin is authentic. So you're saying uh, Cardin Ellis is watching Mormonism live? Yeah, I did see that. So I think that's why he texted LOL. So well, you let me know if he texts you and promises you that he'll release that half hour of suppressed video of you. Uh, Cardin, if you're watching, Cardin, if you're watching, please release that video. And let Jim know that you're going to do it. All right. By the end good. of tonight's show. Sounds good. Uh, no, this is this is the quote from Brigham Young that I think helps put that whole will never lead astray uh, thing in, in what I think is the proper context. Uh, Brigham Young says, can a prophet or an apostle be mistaken? Do not ask me any such question, for I will acknowledge that all the time. But I do not acknowledge that I designedly lead this people astray one hair's breadth from the truth, and I do not knowingly do a wrong, though I may commit many wrongs, and so may you. But I overlook your weaknesses, and I know by experience that the saints lift their hearts to God that I may be led right. And when I first read that, I went, okay, that's the key that I've been missing. Uh, the words that jump out at me are designedly and knowingly. That the promise that the prophet will never lead you astray is a promise of intent, not a promise of impact. That that if somebody tries to become president of the church and their design is to, okay, now I'm president of the church. Mark Hoffman becomes president of the church. Aha, now's my chance to bring down this whole house of cards. Uh, now's my chance to tear it down. Uh, that the promise is that the Lord will not allow that to happen. Uh, Can I ask you a question about that, Jim? I don't sure. mean to interrupt you. Sure. Okay. 
if it comes to the issue or the question of the prophet of the church leading the church astray, right? Does it really make any difference whether it's intentional or inadvertent? Yes, I think it makes a huge. I mean, difference. wouldn't the church be being led astray anyway, regardless of intent? No. Well, the, the the great thing about prophets, the great thing about individuals, the great things about people, is that when our intent is in the right place, we are open to further light and knowledge that can get us back on track. Yes, somebody says impact is greater than intention, and that's true with regard to our relationships with other people. But the promise, I don't think, is ever that the prophet will never, ever have any kind of a negative impact, that that we will never, ever stumble, that we will never, ever make mistakes as a church, uh, that we will never... Uh, the promise is, I think, that uh, the Lord is going to put in place people who are going to do everything in their power to do the right thing. And, and because they are people, because they have agency and because they have biases, because they are, are mortals, uh, those are going to manifest themselves in everything they do, just as they do with everybody else, just as they do in bishops, just as they do in state presidents, just as they do in relief society presidents. Uh, you know, that that's, that's what more, that's the purpose of mortality. That's the reason we are here. We are here to stumble around and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And so. Okay. I'm going to play a couple of clips or actually Maven's going to play a couple of clips, but I'll introduce them. One's from president Nelson. So they're pretty current. That's from 2019 BYU devotional. The second will be from his wife, Wendy Nelson. And what I'm going to ask you is this question uh, after it's over. And hopefully I can remember it right now because I thought it was a pretty good question. Is the fact that prophets teach that they are doctrinally inerrant when, according to your position, they are, in fact, not doctrinally inerrant? Is that conceivably a way in which they can lead the church astray? So I'll let you think about that one, okay, while we okay. play this. But yeah, our commission yes. as ordained apostles is to go into all the world to preach his gospel to every creature. That means we are commanded to teach truth. In doing so, sometimes we are accused of being uncaring as we teach the Father's requirements for exaltation in the celestial kingdom. But wouldn't it be far more uncaring for us not to tell the truth, not to teach what God has revealed. It is precisely because we do care deeply about all of God's children that we proclaim His truth. We may not always tell people what they want to hear. Prophets are rarely popular. <laughs> but we will always teach the truth. Boom. And of course, we're leading up to that point where he says, but we will always teach the truth. And that, to me, is a claim of doctrinal infallibility. Let's, uh, let's see what Wendy has to say, and then I'll let you respond okay. to that. Okay, Jim? Today, it can be difficult to know who speaks the truth. But my testimony is that prophets of God always speak the truth. For this new year, let's put an exclamation mark after every statement from a prophet and a question mark after everything else we read, see, or hear. There we go. Okay, so I've asked a couple of questions at the beginning and in between. Your turn to respond, Jim. Well, is Wendy Nelson in, in, in infallible, inerrant too? Uh, does inerrancy uh, apply to spouses as well as to, to prophets? Uh, well, I don't know, but it does seem like she's saying the same thing that President Nelson said. Right, right. She's reiterating the same thing. Um, I, I, I think they both genuinely believe that, uh, and I think that, uh, and I think that they, th I think they do that. I think that they always speak the truth as they understand it, as they perceive it, uh, and. Uh, I don't think they are standing up and lying to anybody. Uh, I think that's the promise. Uh, does that I mean, however... That. I'm going to let you finish that sentence, but I want to ask you a question about that particular sure. statement when you're done. 
Okay. Oh, okay. I'll go now. So in January of 2016, two yeah. months after the policy of exclusion, when President Nelson got up at the uh, Young Adult Devotional in Hawaii. Right. And he not only claimed that the policy of exclusion was revelation, he said that it was unanimous among the apostles that they saw the spirit of God moving upon President Monson. And it was all of their privilege to sustain this revelation as the mind of the Lord and the will of the Lord. Do you think he was telling the truth about that? You're putting me in a difficult spot on that. It's not a resounding yes, I'm hearing. It's not a resounding yes, but I'm not, it's an, I, I cannot confirm or deny. I'm not, I wasn't in the room. Uh, I, I, I do know that there are people who should have been in the room or were in the room who would say that probably is not how it happened. Um, so, but, but I don't want to, I don't want to jump out and criticize El, then Elder Nelson, now President Nelson, uh, without being somebody who was in the room. I will say that I do think that that whole episode in church history uh, was probably the most trying episode for my own personal faith. Uh, when that when that uh, policy was an was announced, it was the first time really in my life where I was faced with the fact that the church was doing something that was demonstrably and fundamentally wrong. Uh, I, I I found myself completely at odds with with, El, with then Elder Nelson, uh, with the brethren, with the idea that this came from God, because I was absolutely convinced that this flew in the face of everything I understood about the gospel, with the, with the second article of faith, that men will be punished for their own sins, so why are we punishing young children by not allowing them to get baptized? Uh, I, I would say to people, so who would argue, oh, it's okay, it'll all work out, they can get baptized when they're 18. I'm saying, so So what you're telling me now, can you imagine two months before this announcement was made, can you have imagined that you'd be telling somebody that the gift of the Holy Ghost during your adolescence is no big deal? That it doesn't, you know, I mean, so, so, and it was a huge struggle for me. It was extraordinarily painful for me. And, and I contemplated leaving the church over. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and I've talked about this. I think I talked about this with Bill Real. I've talked about this with John DeLynn. But I think I can count on sort of one hand when I've had experiences in my life that I consider truly revelatory, that I consider truly sort of a connection to God. And that happened in answer to prayer on this. And the answer was not that the policy was good or the policy was bad, the policy was right or wrong. It was, please don't leave the church. This is where I want you. This is where you can do the most good. And also, please be patient. It will all work out in the end. Those didn't come to me as words in my brain or as a teletype. But that, you know, Joseph Smith describes this idea of pure intelligence flowing into you. And uh, that's the only way I can sort of describe this experience. So I'm sort of leaning back uh, on my testimony, which may be an apologetic judge. But uh, the thing that frustrated me most also about the policy is when it was rescinded, it it yeah, was, because that was going to be my next question. Three and a half years later, it's rescinded, rescinded and that's it. also revelation, right? So they made it all right. So didn't that take care of your problem? No, it made it worse to some degree. How's that? Well, I didn't. I mean, I, 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 I decided I'm still on the church. You know, this is where the Lord wants me. This is where I'm planted, to use Patrick Mason's term. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, I, I hoped it would start a conversation. Because clearly the brethren made a mistake with the policy and they reversed the mistake with the repeal of the policy. I mean, that is so transparently obvious to anybody that I thought, okay, now we can actually have a discussion over, okay, what happens when the brethren make a mistake? How do we deal with that? How do we continue to be faithful? How do we sustain leaders when we know they are capable of making mistakes, including doctrinal mistakes, not just mistakes about having bad breath and all the other kind of silly mistakes that people cite when they talk about infallibility or fallibility. And it didn't start that conversation. Uh, if anything, it sort of tamped that conversation down because it was, no, they're both revelation and shut up. And, and that's been a source of continuing frustration to me ever since. Because, uh, so, so 
how could God, I mean, God changed his mind in three years. I had a conversation and I won't name the general authority, but I had a conversation with a general authority about this. And he said, look, Jesus, Jesus at the beginning of his ministry said, don't carry purse or scrip. And then three years later, at the end of his ministry, he said, now carry purse or scrip. This is something that the Lord does all the time. And I just sat there and went, really? Really? I, I mean, that that's, that's a procedural sort of thing. I mean, you're, you're talking about the fundamental, you're, you're telling a child they can't be baptized because of who their parents are. And now you're saying that's not a problem at all. And you're saying that God's happy with both of that. It, it, it's the same thing with the priesthood ban. It's amazing to me the, the lengths people are willing to go to pin racism on God instead of Brigham Young. I, I, I'm much more comfortable believing that Brigham Young is a fallible human being could have been a racist just like people in the 19th century and everybody around him uh, than I am in believing that the creator of the universe is a racist. Uh, you know, racism is an evil of man. It is not a creation of God. And 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 so if we can't say, look, Brigham Young did amazing things and he held the church together during a perilous time and he brought us across the plains and he created, you know, uh, the state of Deseret. And he, you know, I mean, he, Brigham Young, clearly the hand of God was working in what Brigham Young was doing. Uh, but do we have to say Brigham Young himself was God? We're not able to say, but his weaknesses, his biases, uh, his, uh, they were manifest too. They didn't go away. His agency was never extracted from him. And the racism that he had prior to becoming president of the church endured while he was president of the church. And I think one of the reasons why the priesthood ban endured as long as it was is that, is that we were terrified of admitting that. And we still haven't admitted it. We've come, we, we've walked right up to the line, right? You read the race and the priesthood essay, we walk right up to the line of saying, yeah, this was a mistake. Yeah, Br this is Brigham Young. But yeah, we disavow all of the theories. I mean, these weren't theories. These were things that I was taught. I was certainly taught uh, that black people bore the curse of Cain. Um, I don't know that I was ever taught in church that they were fence sitters or less valiant in the preexistence, but I was taught that they were, that's, that's clearly the mark of Cain. And the book of Mormon says that black skin is, is, you know, I mean, that's clearly something that was taught and we, we've now disavowed it, but we're not willing to admit that it was the product of error. And, and I, I put... think... go ahead. Well, well, I just think, that's what drives that, that. That's why I say this is the biggest problem in the church. And I want to bring this up to a, a more modern instance than Brigham Young, although I think that's very helpful and illustrative of what you're talking about. President Nelson, January 2016, says the policy of exclusion was revelation. Does that impact in your mind anything else that President Nelson has done or said that he's claimed to be revelation? Uh, yes and no. And that's a squishy answer. Um, it's helped me to understand the mind of Russell M. Nelson. Uh, because I think Russell M. Nelson, uh, I think Russell M. Nelson believes that everything he says is revelation is revelation. And, and the, the problem is that Russell M. Nelson is using the word revelation in a way that previous prophets would likely have used the word inspiration, which somehow is sort of a, 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 a lesser kind of contact with the divine. I mean, I don't think, you know, President Hinckley, President Monson, uh, neither one of them would have used the word revelation as freely as President Nelson does. Uh, but I don't think they were any less inspired. But the word inspiration uh, sort of allows for uh, human input, right? If you're inspired to do something, you have an inspiration from the Lord, you have a prompting from the Holy Ghost, how you carry that out, what you do with it, uh, you, you are part of that mix. The word revelation uh, previous to President Nelson uh, was, was only used kind of to describe things where 
you weren't supposed to think that humans are part of the mix. That's Oh, we received this fax from heaven. This is what revelation is. It's a fax from heaven. Humans had nothing to do with it. We had no input into it. This just came straight down the pure conduit from the sky, and, and we have nothing to do with it. I don't believe that kind of revelation exists, frankly. Uh, I have a question. The Mormon, the Book of Abraham, and all those sorts of things. I think that Joseph Smith was very much an active participant in those kinds of revelations. I, I don't think revelation exists independent of human input and human weakness. My follow-up question, thank you for that, by the way, has to do with your observation about the marked difference in the use of the word revelation with President Nelson versus prior prophets, probably going all the way back to Joseph Smith. I'm not sure anybody's claimed more revelation than President Nelson has, with the possible exception of Joseph Smith. Why do you think there's such a stark difference in that President Nelson leans on this revelation card so much? Uh, well, then you gotta, I, I got to read his mind. Uh, I can't read his mind. Uh, I, I mean, I, I do think that when he says, I'm telling you the truth, that he believes that. And and I do think, you know, people talk about, well, geez, how can you trust a prophet if not everything they say is perfect? I, I think prophets get a whole lot more right than they get wrong. I think President Nelson has done a number of really wonderful things uh, in, in the church. Uh, he's also done some things that I disagree with. I, I really struggle with the idea that we can't use the word Mormon anymore. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I was trained as an actor. I love language and language abhors a vacuum. You can't take the word Mormon out of, out of the world's vocabulary if you don't have something to replace it with. And a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not a suitable replacement. Latter-day Saints is to some degree, but, you know, what's the replacement for Mormonism? Uh you know, and, and the answer is, well, it's the restored church of Jesus, gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's like, well, that's requiring people who don't believe we have the restored gospel to make a truth claim that they don't believe that they use that. I, I, so anyway, I mean, it, it, it's petty to some degree. I, mean, I, I think he's, I think the promise that we have is that these men that stand at the head of the church are doing exactly what they think is the right thing that we are promised that they're going to devote their lives, consecrate their lives to the service of the Lord, and they're going to do everything in their power, and they're going to they're going to tell us the truth. Uh, but and I may have interrupted I'm you. telling you the truth, I can still make mistakes. Yes, and I may have interrupted you. Sorry, uh, I'm because, rambling. No, no, off. it's my fault. It's okay. But I'm not sure. Maybe I interrupted you because I'm not sure I heard the answer to my original question, which was, if President Nelson calls the policy of exclusion revelation, which he did, and you think that was not revelation, then what, on what basis do you judge anything else that he claims to be revelation, to actually be revelation? Uh, okay, well, so I'll, I'll answer that specifically in saying that I, I sort of, when he says revelation, I substitute inspiration mentally. Uh, I, I think uh, that... I mean, I can allow for the possibility that the policy of exclusion came uh, where they were inspired to say, look, you need to take care of these children. You're putting children in a terrible, terrible position uh, with regard to this. And so that was the justification for a policy that did end up, ended up doing precisely the opposite. You know, they, they took a piece of inspiration, added their own biases and preconceptions to it and made a mistake. And then three years later, uh, particularly after they've seen uh, all of the harm and pain they've caused, and I, I mean, one of the things that I was encouraged, President Nelson wasn't willing to say it was a mistake, but he was, was willing to admit that there was pain, that, that what they had done had caused pain and people were upset by, unsettled by it. And so they, they, they seek inspiration and they come up with something else. So, so I can allow for that kind of a possibility. Uh, but I, I, when he says it's revelation, I, I've never, when anybody says it's revelation, I never, ever say to myself, oh, okay, well, uh, then they had nothing to do with it. This is just all pure God and no man. This is all just purely divine. And there is no room for error in this. There is no, uh, there, there is nothing lost in translation from the divine through the mortal. 
Uh, I don't think that ever happens. And so I, that, that's, that's, that's how I frame it. Uh, yeah, one would presume that whether it's inspiration or revelation on the policy of exclusion, that God probably could have seen all the harm that was going to come as a result of it. Uh, no, there, well, there's no question. I mean, that, well, but that, see, that, that, that's a much broader question, right? I mean, that's, that's the question of theodicy, the whole idea, why does God allow any kind of evil? Uh, or why does he allow evil in the church? I mean, when, when I, I, you know, you look back. So at you the admit church, there's evil in the church, even at the highest levels. Isn't that right, Jim Bennett? <laughs> I admit, <laughs> oh, boy. I'm in trouble now, aren't I? Uh, we well, haven't answered yet. I haven't answered which is, yet. Which itself could be an answer. Uh, well, if there is an evil, I know that there's evil in me. I know that the mortality is the struggle between good and evil. And all of us are engaged in that struggle individually. So, of course, we're engaged in that struggle institutionally. Uh, of course, that this has always been the case. I mean, the, exa the example I use to frame this, too, is, okay, uh, racism in the church. How, why would the church allow so much racism uh, for X number of years? My question is, why did the Israelites allow slavery? You have revelations in the Old Testament that condone slavery, that, that, that regulate slavery. Uh, Jesus well, himself- Thank goodness for a second there. I thought you were going to I thought you were gonna say, the question should be, why couldn't white people hold the priesthood until 1829? Oh, gosh. Oh. You had oh. me worried there for a second there. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I'm not making the bait on that one. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Jesus himself said nothing about slavery. In the New Testament- Paul writes a letter to a slave owner while he's returning the slave to him. Now, does, didn't the Lord know during New Testament times that slavery was wrong? I think slavery is a greater evil than any kind of evil uh, that the church has perpetrated. Uh, I can't think of, uh, I mean, the, the owning another human being and the kind of degrading things that, that happen when, when slavery is allowed. Uh, couldn't the Lord have stepped in and told the prophet, you know, hey, Old Testament guys regulating slavery, slavery is wrong. Um, it, I, it, it's, it's the question of theodicy and the, and the idea that the Lord, the, the reason we are here is to figure those things out ourselves and, and to blindly stumble and, and, and make the mistakes and learn from experience rather than learn by lecture. Uh, you know, we, we, we lived, one of the greatest things I think in Latter-day Saint theology is the idea of the pre-existence, the idea that we lived, oh, I got the sexual abuse that uh, Joseph Smith committed comes pretty close and we can get into that. But uh, we lived with God before we came to this earth. We lived when we were in the presence of God and essentially from what we understand, incapable of doing anything wrong because God is right there. We, 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 we clearly are being, you know, every second in the presence of God being guided in everything we do think and say. But a third of us reason, didn't seem to have a problem at that. Who doesn't have a problem with that? A third of us. <laughs> well, which would be billions of people, actually oh, <laughs> billions yeah. of spirit children did not feel compelled to be righteous just because God was there. Right, right. So, but the, the purpose of mortality is this, this idea that, okay, well, what, what, what will you do when you're not guided every second by God, when you're not staring into the presence of God, when you don't have that, you know, and, and we, we keep looking for that. We look for the, the prophet, for the leader to be that God and say, mm -hmm. okay, I don't have to think, I don't have to have responsibility for my own moral choices. Uh, Russell Nelson has that responsibility. All I have to do is do exactly what Russell Nelson does and be Russell Nelson. And, uh, and then that's, I, I, I don't think the Lord wants us to be that lazy. I think we have both the right and the responsibility to have a direct connection to God ourselves and to seek God and to, and to learn from our mistakes. I, I mean, one of the, and this, this may be a bit of a tangent, but Every time someone stands before, before up. Before we go on the tangent then, can okay. you hang on to that tangent? Because I want to ask you this question. Okay. If the leaders of the church are kind of stumbling around trying to do the best they can. Right. And we're stumbling around trying to do the best we can. 
can't we just stumble around trying to do the best we can without leaders who are doing the same thing? Uh, yes, and people do. Uh, I mean, 99, what, what percentage of the world is not Latter-day Saint? They're stumbling around doing the best they can. I think We're it's told, a slight majority. I think it's a slight majority, right? Uh, yes, I, I absolutely, I mean... Uh, we're told in the Book of Mormon that every single person that is born onto this earth is born with the light of Christ. C.S. Lewis has described this idea that all of us intrinsically understand the difference between right and wrong. He describes mm, that mere as Christianity. Mere Christianity. Yeah. That, that is the best evidence, at least internal evidence, for the existence of God. The, exist the, the, the fact that we, that we just instinctively know what is fair, what isn't. What is right? What is wrong? Um, so, yes, uh, you know, I, I, I believe uh, that the Lord, <laughs> I, I don't think the Lord sent us here to fail. And I think that, that, that each of us has a timetable, an eternal timetable, where we learn what we need to learn. Uh, and I think the value of prophets. So, so in saying, can't we just stumble along? Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that the church and the prophets are not valuable and not helpful and, and, and help steer us and guide us in ways where we're not going to stumble nearly as badly. Or we're I thought you were going to say understand. steer us and guide us in the right direction. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if you, can, you can wander into the wilderness and get to where you want to go, but you'll probably get there faster if you have a guide. Uh, I, I, I think the church's value and the and prophet's value uh, is in the community they've created and the ability we have to lift each other up and bear one another's burdens and mourn with those who mourn. Uh, I think there is tremendous beauty and majesty and, and wonder in the church. And a lot of it is on the local level, uh, beyond the the salt lake level i mean the, the things that happen in individual wards uh can i get through my life without my ward family yeah i can uh is my life greatly enriched and blessed by having a ward family help lift me up yes it is well let me ask you this if we're going to follow prophets who we already agree are not going to get everything right and some things they'll get horribly wrong is that better or worse to use them as guides. For example, I've got a watch here, which keeps pretty good time. Yeah. But if my watch were correct, let's say five times for every one time it was wrong and it was really wrong, I wouldn't keep this watch. I'd have to throw it away because it becomes useless to me because I'll never know if it's telling me true time or wrong time. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that's not as generous a ratio as I would give the profits. Okay, which uh, how generous a ratio would you give them? I don't know. I, Ninety-nine out of a hundred? Uh, maybe I don't know. Sorry, I, the watch still has to go. The watch still has to go. Um, well, you're but you're assuming then that there's a better watch, right? You're assuming that okay, I'm going to get rid of this watch and I'm going to get a watch that's right a hundred times out of a hundred times. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that never in the history of the world. Have we had a prophet that has been right a hundred times out of a hundred times with this, with the exception of the savior himself? Uh, oh, he, know, he got things wrong too. They cleaned it up. In they the cleaned New it Testament. Up. All right. Well, that's the, that, that, that's a whole other discussion, but, but, but if you're looking, th this is the thing. And, and this makes people who leave the church really angry because uh, I, I hear a lot of people say, you know, find, pick a better church, you know, uh, elder Ballard, where will you go? All that kind of thing. And they say, well, I'll go anywhere. I'll do whatever. And, you know, I, I, I wish people well uh, in whatever journey their life takes and whatever faith journey they, their life takes. Um, uh, but if, if, if you're going to tell me, okay, well, your watch isn't right enough. It's only right 99 times out of 100. You've got to show me the watch that's right 100 times out of 100 before I'm going to say, well, I'm going to toss this one. Well, um, my watch is really bad because 99 times it's right. But that 100th time, it's not just wrong. It actually is so wrong that it injures people and causes harm and even people to kill themselves. That's how bad this watch is. Never buy a Seiko, I've got to tell you. It's got this really bad part to it. Right. So I'm going to ask you this question. I, I think you're okay with this because you've mentioned this before on other podcasts. You currently, if I'm correct, you disagree 
with President Nelson's stance on the LGBTQ issue. Is that correct? Yes or no? Because I have a follow-up question that's the main question. I think we agree with this. Do I disagree with his stance? I, I, I want to yeah. be very, very careful. Go ahead. Be careful as you and, need. And you, you, I, mean, I, 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 I want to be careful because I, I sustain President Nelson. Uh, and, you know, and, and I recognize the limits and the challenges of what that means. I mean, John DeLynn kept trying to pin me down on this too. And I am going to gracefully abstain and say, I'm going to frame it this way. Uh, I believe that we need further light and knowledge on the LGBTQ issue. Uh, I believe that where we are now is not where we eventually need to be. I am not... Sorry. Well, I am not calling for um, gay ceilings in the temple. I am mm. not calling for any kind of specific action by the church. And I'm not saying the church should do this or is doing this wrong or that wrong. I'm saying that I look forward to the day where the when the kinds of tensions and difficulties we're dealing with now will no longer be there. And I am confident that we are going to get there. I don't know how long it will take. Uh, and I don't know what, what that will look like, but, uh, that my relationship with God, my personal, uh, inspiration leads me to believe that that will be the case in the future. Uh, so I okay. wishy an answer for you. I apologize, but no, it's fine. I'll just use the words that you've used. Cause I want to ask this follow-up. Do you believe that where the church is now and where president Nelson is now in relation to the LGBTQ plus? Right. issues and the church's position on it do you believe that where he is now and where the church is now because he's the head of the church do you believe that that has caused harm and even suicide among certain segments of the membership of the church yes okay of course it has and i and i think they know that no it has you know uh, elder holland in his musket fire talk which i did not appreciate to be honest, uh, talked about the tears that he shed and the tears that, that, that they're shedding because they're aware of those. They know this is causing harm. They know that people are killing themselves. Uh, and, and, you know, if we can't acknowledge that, then we can't stop it. Then we can't change it. Then we can't fix it. That's why I'm calling for further light and knowledge. Uh, so where I don't want to go with that is to say, yes, it's causing harm. And therefore, Russell Nelson and Jeff Holland and all these people are terrible people and evil and the church is awful and this, that, the other. Uh, I, I, I think Elder Holland's tears are genuine. I thought, uh, Elder, I thought Elder Holland was crying because his musket kept misfiring. Oh, well, okay. But, no, but I'm, I'm kidding. I mean, I think they're okay. genuinely troubled and they feel like, okay, they are boxed into a corner. Um, yes, and this is where I want to go now to conclude before phone calls. Because I think they are boxed into a corner. They're painted into a corner. I think that they have painted themselves into this corner. If not them individually, then the church leadership over a long period of time, and which they have adopted for the most part, has painted themselves into this corner of doctrinal inerrancy. And they can't make mistakes in doctrine and they can't be criticized for what they do according to elder oaks so this is the box i think they painted themselves into having identified as you have that you feel this idea of doctrinal inerrancy is the single greatest problem in the lds church i want to first give you the chance to summarize why it is that you think that's the greatest problem as opposed to anything else and then let you give your thoughts on how the church could resolve this issue. So it's no longer a problem. Uh, it's the greatest problem because everything, everything stems from it. I mean, every kind of problem we have, it, it, it's like, okay, are people killing themselves uh, because of what the church teaches? Well, yes. Uh, so let's fix it. Well, if we can't acknowledge that, uh, no, 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 the church is inerrant. The church has never made a mistake on this. Uh, then we can't go back and fix the mistake and deal with the problems of the mistake. The tangent I was going to go off on earlier was is the idea that whenever anybody stands up in testimony meeting, 
they always talk about the, the first phrase out of their mouth is, I know the church is true. Uh, there is nowhere in the scriptures where the Lord says, this is the only true church. The only time he comes close is in Doctrine and Covenants section 1, verse 30, where he says, this is the only true and living church. And the living is just as important as the true. And the living, living things either grow or they die. They either, you know, they, they learn, even Jesus himself learned line upon line, precept on precept, living things have to evolve, have to grow. Ha and, and the church is no different. For the church to be a living church, living things make mistakes, living things repent for their mistakes, and living things learn from their mistakes. And so I think this is the biggest problem because it prevents us from learning from our mistakes. You know, we're seeing this now with now racism. We're hearing all these messages about racism and how terrible racism is, and we need to not be racist. And I love it. I think it's great. So how do we repent for our racism in the past? Well, we don't even acknowledge it. We don't even acknowledge that it's been significant or that, I mean, we do in sort of broad strokes. We bury it in an essay somewhere, uh, but we still haven't said it was an actual mistake. We still haven't. I mean, uh, it, the reason, if we could do that, if somebody could stand up, if Dallin Oaks could stand at the pulpit and say, I mean, you know, he was at the B1 celebration and he said, you know, I, I kept praying about all of the, the justifications for the priesthood ban, and none of them felt good to me. But I never said anything for 30 years, and now I'm saying something now. Uh, but he still wouldn't say it was a mistake or could have been a mistake. He still framed it as God is inscrutable. God's racism is his own, you know, we, we can't call God racist because he's God. So why he acted in a very racist way? I mean, it, that's not a sustainable um healthy kind of way for anybody to build faith. It doesn't build anybody's faith. And I think it's a, a huge problem. And I think people leave the church because they encounter a clear, obvious error and have no tools to deal with it. They are unequipped to confront Brigham Young's statements about killing interracial couples. They are unequipped when they see that Joseph Smith in polygamy did some things that were just you know, he, that, that he was dishonest with, with Emma and all this kind of stuff. I mean, how do you deal with that if these people aren't capable of making mistakes, if they are inerrant? Uh, President Eyring always says in conference, you never have to believe anything in this church that isn't true. And, and if you have to believe that President Eyring and his brethren are all inerrant, you have to believe something that isn't true. And we would be such a healthier organization, and I think uh, a more trusted organization. I would trust uh, a general authority who would stand up and say, you know, I made a mistake, and we made a mistake, far more than I would trust one who wouldn't be willing to say that. I would, I mean, initially, I think the blow might be hard for a lot of people, but then all of a sudden it's, oh, okay, we're all in this together. I, I mean, I, I love the word sustain. I, I don't worship these men. I sustain them. Well, we never talk about sustaining Jesus Christ. I don't sustain Jesus as my Savior. Sustain is a verb that involves me giving something of myself to lift somebody else up, to help somebody else up. Jesus Christ doesn't need our help, but our leaders do. We sustain them not because they're infallible, but precisely because they are not. And if we can admit that, and if we can accept that, I think that I think the inspiration that would flow from that, the trust that would flow from that, would be staggering. It would be a beautiful, beautiful thing. If if it, I mean, if the general authority could stand up at a pulpit, uh, how much would you feel for them if they if you recognize that they're including you? They're not speaking down to you. They are, you know. They are brothers and sisters with you. They are on equal footing with you. They, you have as much direct access to heaven as Russell Nelson does. Uh, that church is the church that I long for. And I think it's the church that is possible. And I think, and I think we're moving slowly in that direction. Do you expect to have that happen in our lifetimes? Yes. 
Do you really? After my life, you must be planning on living a long time, man. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I sometimes think, and I've said this behind the scenes, but I sometimes think we're being set up for a Nixon to China moment. You know, it's an old Vulcan proverb: only Nixon could go to China. Spock says that to Kirk in Star Trek VI. You know, when when Nixon went to China, Nixon was the hard, most hardcore anti-communist in history, and yet he was the one that made overtures to Red China and opened it up to the West. Um, would it be more or less significant if the person who opens up the church to greater inclusion is Dieter Uchtdorf or Dallin Oaks? I mean, I mean, if, if it were Dallin Oaks that were that did that. Uh, all of the people, all of the hardliners who are absolutely, no, there can never, ever, ever, ever be any change in this. Uh, Dallin Oaks would have a credibility there that I don't know that anybody else would. So so I, I am hopeful. I, I don't have any hard evidence that that's where we're going. Uh, I continue to sustain my church leaders. I continue to recognize that this is an imperfect, uh, true, and living church. Uh, that has more to learn. I have more to learn, but I want to give as much grace and uh, to the weaknesses of my leaders as I hope they will give to me. Okay, fair enough. And I appreciate that. I think that concludes our discussion. You can add anything you want, but I would really like to open up the lines and let our callers. All right, callers, come after me. Yeah, time for the callers to roast Jim. There we no, go. No, I, I told Jim beforehand that we have live call-ins on this live show and in over 100 episodes i have never had any caller be rude to anybody on the show whether it's me or bill by the way bill's missing in case you hadn't noticed <laughs> i think he's in florida is that right maven he's in florida i think so i feel bad he's... for not being 100 percent sure i know he leaves we don't care we don't keep track of him no we care deeply and we Hope that he's having a great time in wherever he is, doing whatever it is he's doing. And we look forward to having him back safely next week. Um, so I definitely have some calls. Um, I, one showed up like as soon as I logged in before I had even put the ticker on. Um, really? So, yeah. So let's uh, go ahead and get the first one. Um, okay. So... <laughs> Yes. Hello. Okay. I can hear you. Can you guys hear? Hello. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi, Brother Bennett. Hi. Um, I just go by PFM. Um, PFM? I'm hoping you might be able to help me and uh, maybe we could do something to move the church in a better direction. I'm an inactive member and uh, just don't feel comfortable when I attend church. And I'm sort of in a space where I want to be like, I don't really want to be in the celestial kingdom. I want to be a terrestrial Mormon. I'm divorced. That's a big black mark, as you probably know, socially. And part of the issue that I'm having is I've got a couple of medical problems. Uh, one of them is uh, cardiac related. My cardiologist has prescribed for me five ounces of red wine. And I told them I'm a member of the church. They actually wrote a prescription. Now, I don't bring this up to my bishop because I'm inactive. Um, another doctor, for a different reason, has prescribed me coffee in the morning. Uh, I have taken that up. Can but I tell you a quick story? My agency, just... my agency I, I don't really want to be a god. I don't want to be in the celestial kingdom. I don't want to do all that. But I would like to attend church. Is there any way you could expand the options? that the church could be more inclusive of members who aren't really interested in the celestial kingdom model. That could you help with that? Is there, I mean, is there any way that that can be more acceptable? Boy, that is a great, great question. I, I want to jump back to your prescribed wine and coffee and tell you that my great grandfather, Heber J. Grant, when he was president of the church was prescribed to drink a glass of beer every night before bed. So I don't know if that helps you or hurts you, uh, but that's, that's historical precedent. Bennett, I don't even, I don't even obey my cardiologist. I don't like the red wine. Oh, okay. Um, it doesn't taste very good. All I right. Mean, I, I just want to Heber J. Grant's doctor. To yeah. It. You got to go to Heber J. Grant's doctor. Do you understand my dilemma? I do. 
you know, and I, and I have a, I have a nice home and it's paid off and I really don't want to get remarried. I don't want all the trouble that may ensue. It's a personal choice that I want to be single, but I, I just not accepted in that church. So I've gone to the Lutheran and Catholic church. I'm not, I don't really fit in there either, but it's, I am just not included. And I'm, I'm hoping you might be able to take the message to the brethren that they need to, they need to change some things. I mean, I'm not saying that they let people drink wine and coffee. I'm not saying, I'm just saying single older people are just not, they don't fit in and they're not accepted. And I mean, culturally. I, I, a problem. I, I think it's a real problem. I would love to take your message to the brethren and I would love it if the brethren would listen to me. So far, I haven't had a whole lot of success in that regard. Uh, you know, I, 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 I speak for no one but myself. Uh, and I don't have the ability to influence the church, but what you're describing is is a very real problem that I think the church is <laughs> just sort of beginning to understand. Uh, I, 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 the statistics that I've seen recently are that there are more single adult members of the church now than there are married adult members of the church. Uh, and so, I mean, this you is. Know, a I, I had a thought. I had a thought. Let me just put it out there. My mother, she passed away in 2020, and believe me, she was a saint. She was a temple worker, I mean, for like a long time. She was a total saint. She told me that when she was a little girl, that her grandmother, which is not my grandmother, it'd be my grandmother's mother, they used to brew beer for the men when they worked out on the field and the farm. We're right. talking Fairview, Utah. Yeah, okay, now, so this is before 1954. This is before the hard enforcement of the Word of Wisdom. There was still polygamy, you know, pre-54 in some of the leadership. Of course, it was being weeded out. And I don't have any problem with my mother acknowledging these things. But she was kind of like, well, sometimes, David, the church isn't always doing the right thing for you. Um, you know, they do the right thing for them, but it might not work for you. Now, my father died of a heart attack at 78. Both my grandfathers died of heart attack. One at 67. He had five heart attacks, four heart attacks. And the other one at 76. All of hey, them obeyed the word of wisdom PFM. 100%. Now, I'm in a situation where I can't just say, oh, uh, the word of wisdom will make me live. I've got hypercholesterolemia, and there's just no way that I, I should probably follow my cardiologist. So my situation is, hey, PFM. you know, I, I just don't fit in. PFM, I, I think we're going to go ahead and, and move on to another caller. You did have a great question, and I, I think it is something, you know, we're thinking about is if, if the church would open things up to people who don't want to, okay, I guess, go fine. as no far problem. as much. Thank but you. we appreciate you calling in. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for calling in. I think that's a great question. I think that Jim's answered it about as well as he can, but it is important to notice that even though we have concerns and justifiable concerns for those in the LGBTQ community, that the church's model for celestial living uh, doesn't work for more people than just within those groups. It also doesn't work for single people in the church. And like you said, Jim, I think you're correct that now the majority of people in the church are single. And the question is whether the church is going to respond to this quick enough to keep more people from moving. Yeah. No, there's no place for kind of Mormons as in, I, you know, I, I mean, one of the things uh, that Jeremy Runnels uh, who wrote the CES letter, he and I, I, I actually consider Jeremy a friend. I, we, we, we have made peace and I think even a little more than that. I really like the guy, uh, but he's, he's debunking my reply on his site. And his biggest criticism of me is that uh, I don't live real Mormonism. I live Jim Bennett Mormonism. And real Mormonism or chapel Mormonism or whatever label you want to put to it uh, is different from the Mormonism that everybody else practices. And I would push back on that and say, yes, you're right. I live Jim Bennett Mormonism and you live RFM Mormonism and everybody who is in the church lives their own version of it. And we understand that and accept that rather than trying to put everybody into sort of a, uh, make everybody a cookie cutter template of everybody else. I, I think we'd have a happier church and I think we'd be able to deal with TFM's 
uh, issues a little better than we are than we currently do. I think that's a great response to the phone call. Jim, do we have any more phone calls, Maven? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and put the next one up. I believe this is caller Eric. All right, can you hear us, Eric? Hi, RFM. Hi. Yes, I am. I am. Thank you, Maven. Uh, RFM, nice to talk to you. Jim, thank you so much for coming on. I sure appreciate it. Thanks. I, I, I do want to express, though, some frustrations I've felt while I've been listening to you this evening and when I've listened to your podcast in the past. And, and that frustration is this idea of profits being imperfect, profits making mistakes. You say that over and over as though that is the solution to the problems that people have with profits. And that's not the issue, particularly with Joseph Smith. The problem with Joseph Smith is that he repeatedly and intentionally did bad acts. Joseph Smith did not accidentally marry any children. He did it on purpose, and he did it over and over. Joseph Smith didn't accidentally marry his wife's best friend behind her back. He did it on purpose, and he did it over and over. No one can honestly define those actions as mistakes or being imperfect. He did those things on purpose. He made a choice and he did it and he did it repeatedly. So I don't think it's fair to talk about mistakes. I mean, when you talk about mistakes, it does feel a little bit like, you know, you were saying uh, prophets have bad breath or whatever, or whatever. These aren't mistakes. These are choices. They're bad acts. Now, I'm willing to acknowledge that within the framework of, of Christianity, I think you can say prophets can be prophets and still perform incredibly bad acts, heinous bad acts, like Joseph Smith. But the problem is you run smack dab into the, the church's idea of worthiness that mm. is very, very important throughout throughout history. So I'd like you to address that. I mean, first of all, are you willing to acknowledge that the issue with Joseph Smith was not mistake? It was intentional bad action. And, and how do you square that with the idea of worthiness? Thank you for your call, Eric. We'll let Jim respond. Wow. Um, no, that is a great question. Uh, I, if you got the perception that what, that I am defining mistakes uh, as as the bad breath sort of, oops, I, I did something wrong. Um, uh, I apologize because that's not what I mean. I, mistakes, I think mistakes include bad acts. Uh, the prophets are capable of, of bad acts. I am capable of bad acts. You are capable of bad acts. Uh, so we shouldn't think that the prophets aren't capable of bad acts. Uh, you know, the difference between I, one, of, one of the most important lessons I learned when I was a teacher in the teacher's quorum at 14 years old, my teacher said, a lie is anything said with the intent to deceive. So if I tell you how to get to my house and I mistakenly tell you to turn left when you should have turned right, I haven't lied to you, even though the impact is the same as if I had. But if I don't want you to come to my house and so I know that I'm telling you to turn left when you should turn right, I'm lying to you. That's a bad act. That's not a mistake. Uh, so uh, when, when you're evaluating Joseph Smith, the difficulty with evaluating Joseph Smith is that to determine the difference between a bad act and a mistake uh, requires us to understand Joseph Smith's intent. And I think uh, with regard to particularly uh, how he related with Emma, uh, my, my biggest problem, I mean, the marriages, particularly the youngest marriages, uh, you know, Helen Mark Kimball, you know, was proposed by her father as sort of a dynastic ceiling. It's, it's, it's very unlikely that that was a sexual relationship. Uh, I'm not one of these people that says Joseph had no sexual relationships with any of his plural wives. That's nonsense. He clearly did. Uh, I think the worst act he did was how he dealt with Emma, how he dealt with his wife. Uh, with his legal wife is that he, he married women and, and didn't tell Emma that he was doing that. And he mocked up. You know, answered the question, Jim, sorry. I feel like we're kind of going around in circles. Right. I'm um, not answering the question. I, 
Eric, do you feel he's answered the question? Uh, well, well, he might be on uh, on the way, but I mean, one one of the issues is Jim. You're right. I mean, we we all agree that Joseph Smith did bad things. You know, no one on the show is going to disagree with that. The issue is number one, I, you, you're soft peddling it by calling them mistakes. Those aren't mistakes. That's not how anyone uses that word mistake. Uh, and and I've, I've, I've apologized for that because I'm, I, I, I'm trying. Okay. Prophets are capable of bad acts. Is that helpful? I guess okay. if I can cut in, yeah, my, it is. my problem is, Jim, I just, I can't give Joseph Smith any credit for intent. So I, I, I just, I don't care and I can't see it as good. I really, really can't see a 37 year old man marrying a 14 year old girl um, with good intentions period. And so I, for me, that's not enough of a past, you know, like maybe for other revelations, you can try to say he thought he was doing the right thing. Um, but this one I can't get over. And so I, I don't know. I know I'm cutting in kind of on like with Eric's thing, but I, I that's my issue. It, I get like what Eric is saying. It's not a, just a, oh, a little oopsie, you know, you don't accidentally marry 14 year olds. Uh, regardless of whether uh, they are given to you by their father, which I mean, we could argue that point too, but if I just gave it to you, like it's still really messed up. So what do you think about that, Jim? And, and to, and to... Let's let Jim respond to what Maven yeah, said. Um, and I'll, I'll go, go ahead, ahead. And, and probably let you go after this, Eric, just so we can get through the, the rest of the calls. But thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for calling in with a great question. Go ahead, Jim. I, a polygamy wasn't an accident. Polygamy was intentional. Uh, Joseph Smith's polygamy was intentional. Uh, I, I don't think there's any any question about that. Uh, so I'm not trying to deny that. I'm not trying to downplay it. I'm not trying to soft pedal it. Uh, and polygamy is problematic for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I, 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 I don't think that we do anybody any favors by pretending otherwise. Uh, it just and, feels like that's what you're kind of doing. Well, or when you're, I, I, I just feel like because you can't, answer the question very quickly we're we're taking a long meandering path and then i i think i feel like little breadcrumbs are getting dropped. what would be what there. would be a quick answer you'd want to hear from me um that's a good question i just i just feel like we start going on a whole bunch of tangents so like i don't even know well, like, well, it's, 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 coming back well, around. i mean if, if you say joseph smith is a pedophile and i say no he wasn't uh, you'll just say, oh, what, what do we mean? But the, I mean, all of these things require a huge amount of context to be able to understand it. it, it it's the criticism that I got when I responded to the CES letter. The CES letter is 80 pages. My response is 400 pages. If you don't think Joseph Smith I w was a, maybe a, a sexual predator, then what, I mean, I guess the other side of that I would think is that, well, then God did ask him to do that. So if he's not a sexual predator, but he's acting like one, and if you don't think that God told him that, how do you reconcile that? Uh, I think that Joseph Smith, that the doctrine of sealing together the human family uh, is the core doctrine uh, that that uh, at the heart of polygamy. And I think at its heart, that is a beautiful and pure and wonderful and marvelous thing. And I think that Joseph Smith took that and went, well, how do I do that? Well, I guess I marry everybody. And so he performed all of these marriages and married all of these women uh, and, uh, and lied to Emma about it. Uh, and I think that's hugely problematic. Uh, I think you can, you can look at it and say, okay, at its core, there was something Joseph Smith was trying to do that was good and wonderful uh, that, that he perverted through his own whatever it was, and it became what it was. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't, I can't imagine anybody looking at polygamy, and looking at Joseph Smith's polygamy, and saying, "Boy, that's great. That's exactly what ought to have happened." Uh, it just seems weird. I guess I, I do think that's probably the best answer that you can give, uh, Jib. So I, I appreciate that, um, but. It's just, I, it's just a, a strange wonder to me, I guess, that this well, kind of well, 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 let me finish that, that he could still be a prophet, but I, but a truth teller in the modern church, you know, just, just for saying that a thing that happened, happened, uh, fill in the blank with anything you want, gets communicated, excommunicated. 
um, and loses their salvation over telling the truth. But but God was okay with this huge like horrific mistake. And I mean, and the other end of that, I like think God was okay with it. Like, well, I, mean, God it happen, okay with it. I guess he didn't care enough to stop it, and he didn't care enough about the girls. Well, Joseph Smith died when he was thirty-eight years old. He's not Russell Nelson, who lived to be ninety-eight. My wife thinks that has something to do with polygamy. We've talked about that. I don't I know. Agree Nobody there. Knows. But yeah. but 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 uh, yeah. I, I mean, we can take the next. I I think you answered my question. It's not the answer well, that I want, I, but it's what. I, I mean, I, I, but I know that that's a huge problem for somebody for, for for people, and I and 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 I think it should be a huge problem for people. And I don't think the church and individuals in the church have done anybody any favors by refusing to confront it. I mean, I'm certainly not going to be able to resolve it with you or with a caller uh, in a few minutes. Uh, this is a discussion that we ought to have been having for the last 150 years and which we have swept under the rug because we refuse and, and we sing praise to the man and we refuse to just to confront it. Uh, because I think if we confront it, you find you find some some really amazing, wonderful stories of faith in polygamy. Uh, uh, along with all of the draws, yeah. And, totally uh, so we haven't done that. We have. We, we are so far behind as a church because we haven't been willing to confront it and haven't been willing to look at it head on. By which I understand you to mean that the leaders of the church have not been willing to confront it head on. Yeah, but I, but I, but uh, but I think all of us. Nobody wants to talk about polygamy. Well, you know, I think I, if the leader set the example, then there would be a lot. The leader more set the example that we would follow. It. Sure. But now I want to, let me follow up with this one question because it occurred to me that when you're talking about Joseph Smith and polygamy, you're focusing most of your distaste, if I can put it that way, on Joseph Smith lying to Emma yeah. about what it was he was doing. That's exactly my right. biggest problem with it. Doesn't mean I don't have any problem with anything else, but that's my biggest problem. That was my sense. That's why I wanted to follow up on that and ask you this. If Joseph Smith is willing to lie to his legal wife, Emma, the person that he presumably would be closest to and under the most duty to be honest with. Do you think it's possible that Joseph Smith would lie to members of the church? Yeah, I think it's possible that. All, uh, yeah, I don't think there's ever a moment where it wasn't possible. Is it possible for anybody to lie? Well, do you, That's okay. Be, beyond being possible and just hypothetical, do you think that Joseph Smith did lie to members of the church about anything? <sighs> Uh, well, clearly he lied about polygamy, or Richard Bushman uses the phrase carefully worded statements. Or carefully worded denials. That was in the carefully gospel topic denials. essay. Yeah, he, he, yeah. He, would, he would frame things and try to do it in a way where he felt like he was not uh, technically lying, sort of Clinton-esque kinds of things. It depends mm -hmm. on what the definition of the word is, is that kind of stuff. Yes, it, appears, um, it depends on what the definition of, oh, what a thing it is to be accused of having seven wives when I can find only one. Right, one, right, right, right. That's the, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that that's part of the historical record. So, yeah. Um, uh, do I think that Joseph Smith routinely lied to the church and that, that Joseph Smith was fundamentally dishonest? No, I do not. And not even asking that. So if he lied about polygamy, is it possible he lied about any of his claimed visionary experiences? It's possible. I don't think that he did, but I think it's possible. Okay. Sure. I think we have to uh, agree that it's certainly possible. And well, how could it have... not be possible? That's why I think we have to agree on it. Yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. But, but, but see, that's where faith comes in. You have to decide. All right. Yes. Of course, it's possible that Joseph Smith was lying. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe he was lying or do you not believe he was lying? Uh, and where I think is polygamy is such an, I'm sorry. I think polygamy is such an interesting example because it's not just something over here like the word of wisdom or some kind of tangential sort of thing that Joseph Smith introduced. Polygamy was for him the crowning ordinance of exaltation. Yeah. Well, it's if you not mean, dispensable in his view. It, well, um, I think in terms of, of the idea, I think it became more indispensable uh, to his successors. Uh, I, I, you'll, you'll find a whole lot more sermons by Brigham Young about the eternal nature and the essential nature of polygamy uh, than you'll find from Joseph Smith. Well, certainly because it was a secret with Joseph Smith, but with Brigham with Young after 1852, right. he comes out and says, 
man, any boo boo, we're out here in Utah and you can't do anything to us, federal government. Right. Right. So, uh, Wait, sorry, I don't, I, I keep, I don't want to cut off. Uh, if you were still going, I just wanted, we still have three or more callers. I didn't know right. if you want to go to the Yeah, next. let's go ahead. Let, okay. Is that okay, Jim? Three more callers. Oh, sure. And okay. then, yeah. Okay. So let me get the next one pulled up here, but I did want to say you both agreed that it's impossible for humans not to lie. So, you know, everybody does it sometimes. So I want to say there's a reason why we still call certain people liars. It's not because we're saying they're human and they lie, but they have a pattern of lying all the time. Pattern of behavior, according yeah. to Tyresha Lusota Hale. Yeah. Okay. So I've got the next caller on, um, I believe from Idaho. Can I go ahead and get your name? Yeah, it's Colby. Oh, hey, Colby. Welcome to the show. Hi, Colby. Hi, Maven. How are you? Hi, Jim. Um, thanks for coming on tonight. Before I get to my question, I just want to thank you for appearing on a program like this. Um, you and I have exchanged a few times on Reddit. And so I, I think you'll kind of see where my question is going. But I want to ask my question specifically about um, you highlighted Elder Oak statement at the B1 celebration where he essentially said paraphrase it but he essentially said I knew that the reasons weren't true the justifications that I was hearing or at least says that I didn't receive confirmation of them which I guess I would say is he knew they weren't true um, but he decided to side with the institution of the church he says I chose to be loyal to the church leaders Right. my personal experience story what led me out of the church a neighbor my bishop was abusing kids and mm -hmm. our stake tried to cover it up and i tried to write letters to salt lake and get those policies changed and yet they just continued to double down and story after story after story come out about how problematic their policies are so my big question is i guess it's a two-part question it's number one and I want to know you specifically, what are you doing to actually change the church's, this big problem that you're saying, this is the number one problem that we believe we can't correct prophets, or at least that we can't have this conversation about their decision. What are you doing to correct it? And what can average members do to correct it? Because from my experience, I tried it and I'm no longer a member. All I had to do was ask about the process of resignation after resignation confirmation in eight days so i don't think the church is willing to make the changes that you say need to happen i mean i love your vision of the church it's a much more body of christ model but i i truly don't think the church will ever pivot that direction so what can average members do i guess my follow-up question would be you know you use the analogy of lying and directions to a house you said, if I give you the wrong, you know, the wrong direction, whether the person deliberately lies to you or just accidentally gives you the wrong direction, you still don't end up at the house. Right. So how many times where you don't end up at the house do you finally go, I'm not taking direction from this person anymore? That is a great, great question. Uh, I, I mean, to, to answer specifically, what am I doing and what can the average member do? Uh, I'm doing this. Well, uh, yeah, and if, if I can be, if I can be a little bit more direct too, I mean, in one sense, and I know you carefully worded it, but you seem to be suggesting that the church's teachings and its policies on LGBT are in, LGBT are incorrect, or at least that you don't. You think that there's further light and knowledge yes. required. So, are you just doing what Elder Oaks did 30 years ago? How how are you not just doing that? That's what I want to really understand. Uh, to some degree, I am. Uh, it's a fair criticism. To some degree, I, I I am. I want to stay a member of the church. I know where the boundaries are. I know that there are certain things that I can and can't say publicly uh, about what I feel and what I believe. I, I, I think if I were to come out in full opposition to the church, in, uh, then, 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 I, then I would be on the outside instead of on the inside. And I think I, I can, be, I can affect more change from the inside. And in order to do that, 
uh, I have to agree to certain boundaries. And, and, and you are exactly right. I, I, you know, and you can hold me accountable for that and say, oh, geez, uh, Jim, you're, you're, you are hedging, you are doing, and, and that is exactly what I am doing, yes. Uh, the, currently, there are certain boundaries uh, that if you want to stay in the church, I mean, I'm a member of the Tabernacle Choir, and I want to stay a member of the Tabernacle Choir. Singing in the Tabernacle Choir is one of the great joys of my life. It is just an absolutely beautiful, magnificent experience. Uh, and I think I can have more impact by working within the restraints and within the boundaries that are, are yes, are placed upon me if I want to stay an active member of the church. I can't come out and crusade against leaders of the church if I want to stay an active member of the church. And I, and I think I can do more good as an active member of the church uh, than I could if I decided to just throw caution to the wind and ignore all of those boundaries and then set up my own RFM competing podcast criticizing the church. I think the church... Jim, more, I, anyway. Jim, I wanted to follow up with just two brief questions. The first was this. Do you believe... Because you talked about if you came out in full opposition was your expression. Do you feel that if you said what you really feel publicly, that that would be taken as coming out in full opposition to the church? And then the second question is, how do you personally feel about being a member of a church that if you said how you really felt, regardless of how respectfully you said it, that you would be kicked out? Man, you don't want to make this easy for me, do you? Those are both pretty good questions. Those are you both very, very good questions. you like. I had the experience of of coming out in full opposition to the church uh, at the time of the 2015 policy. I had a blog at the time and I just blasted the church for the policy. It, it, I mean, it, it was, I was so angry and so upset that I just exploded. And I said, this is wrong. This is evil. I, I mean, I, I did not mince any words. I did not pull any punches. I said that there is nothing about this. And I was aghast at the reaction which was leave get out of here then you don't like it get lost and i thought okay i've been an active member of this church i'm a sixth generation member of this church i return missionary whatever I, I can check any boxes so the first time i express a, a, a profound disagreement your initial reaction is get lost really and that was very frustrating to me. And that's, I mean, that led up to sort of my revelatory moment where I decided, okay, this is where God wants me. I'm going to play by the rules. I'm going to stay in the church. And since then, I have not said those kinds of things. Uh, if I said those kinds of, I mean, I mean, do the math. I mean, you, I mean, <laughs> uh, I think everybody, you know, the, the, I, I, th I think, that if you heard the private opinions of every member of the Quorum of the Twelve, uh, you would be stunned uh, to discover how deep some of them disagree with some of the things the church has done. Uh, uh, you don't see that as much. We have the family hey. lore to some degree where I mean, the, the, these Thursday meetings where they meet with each other. Uh, and Jesus. And, yeah, no. No, anyway, yeah, that's that's a we didn't get into that. I wanted to get into that, but we didn't we didn't we didn't cover that. Hey, hey, I, Jim, I guess I guess so. If I can follow up, I I'm not surprised to hear they disagree. I mean, I love I love the heroes that I view of Mormon history who disagreed and were dissenters. People like Talmadge and D. H. Roberts, but the church now, like it's it's such a dysfunctional system that it requires them to agree. I I don't. That to me is the biggest problem is they need to change these things and they were, they seem to refuse to be willing to change. I mean, other iron thought, but it's a sin to even think of human, of human weakness in your leaders. That's right. false. I mean, I don't even believe in that, but that's false doctrine. According to Mormon doctrine. I agree. Book, I mean, that's, that's, that's false doctrine and no one calls them out on that. So, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want people like you to leave the church because I love the church still, even though it's such a confusing relationship. But there's a lot of wiggle room between not doing anything and 
coming out in open opposition to starting, you know, Jim Bennett's RFM spinoff podcast, which I'd love to right. listen to. But that's what I want to know. Like, if this is the big problem in Mormonism, how do you fix it if that's just stay? Because I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I felt stronger about writing those letters to Salt Lake than I've ever felt about anything aside from marrying my wife. But that's what God wanted me to do. And it led me out of this church. How am I supposed to believe that these people are led by God? Boy, I, and I can hear it in your voice. I, 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 I mean, I, I feel for you. I, 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 I don't have a specific answer for you uh, that can solve that other than to, to tell you where I am. Uh, I mean, because as I've heard stories like yours and I've heard other people, uh, the, the one thing that has been really amazing to me is I've sort of entered this world. I, you know, I, I didn't wasn't involved in this at all until I wrote my CES letter reply and that sort of threw me into this, this whole world. Uh, I, I have been uh, astonished and amazed by the dignity and the kindness and the goodness of people who have left this church. And that's not something you ever hear in church. Uh, but uh, w what it's done to me is recognize we treat people who leave this church horribly on the whole. We, we demonize them. We, we say that they can never be happy and that they're, they're, they're I mean, they're evil and wicked. And, and I've met so many people who have left the church because they have been following their conscience. I have yet to meet somebody who has left the church because they wanted to become a big drinker or they wanted to, I mean, I mean, this idea that I really wanted to sin, maybe it happens, I'm, but I haven't met them. I don't know who they are, but I've met all kinds of people who just talk about the church with such pain and such longing because the church has been such a disappointment to them on a personal level uh, that uh, I, I, th that I think is a huge problem. How we treat people who leave this church is, is I think, one of our biggest sins. I, I don't know of any commandment from the Lord well, that we're supposed to treat people who leave like well, garbage. I, well, and I really appreciate that. It's obvious that I have strong feelings about it, but one of the things that's so frustrating about being where I'm at is all I have done is follow the principles that the church taught me. And following those principles, being more devoted to the principles than to an institution is what led me where I am today. So I absolutely appreciate that you're you're sympathizing with me. And I know you are a very good, kind person. But I, I really do want to hear how can active members, I, like I already understand that's a problem. I want to know, in your opinion, how can active members try and fix it? Thank you. I'll go ahead and let you go and then let, let Jim answer that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Colby. Good hey, hearing from you. So Goaty McGoatface before this said, I was irritated most of the time, but now I just feel sad for Jim. And <laughs> I don't think anybody needs to feel sad for me. I I, 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 I don't feel sad for me. Um, how, how can people within the church fix it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. If I did, I would fix it. Uh, I'm doing everything I know how to do, which is I'm trying to engage respectfully with people in the church and outside the church and have conversations. And, 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 you know, I don't have, I don't have all the answers. I don't know how many answers I have. All I have is my life, uh, my experience. And if that's of any value to anybody, then great. And if it's not, then great. But, uh, I think having conversations like this is is the first place to start. And I and I I don't know that. I mean, I know we want to blame the leaders, uh, and and certainly the leaders uh, set the the tone and the example. Uh, but individually, on on a one on one level, on on the local level, um. I think we need to be better. What do we do when, when a wife decides she doesn't believe, but the husband still believes or vice versa? Mixed faith marriages are a huge, huge deal that we never, ever, ever talk about. Uh, and uh, when your child leaves the church, the stories of people cutting out their children, you know, the church ran that awful video about the guy who was setting up his inheritance 
And I, but I made sure that if they don't have a temple recommend, they get nothing and it all goes to the church. I'm like a church teaching people that that's how you treat your children uh, to me is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's antithetical, I believe, to the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. So why are the prophets of God teaching us that? I think turning a boat the size of the church is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I, I think, and I, and I think that the prophets of God uh, recognize, feel a tremendous responsibility uh, that they don't want to make that huge a turn unless heaven sends them the facts. And I don't think heaven's sending them the facts. I think heaven's expecting them to make those kinds of decisions. And I think that we've built a system that is sort of stuck in the mud to some degree. Um, I, 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 I th things that can't go on forever don't. And, you know, this is either going to change and go on for the better, or the church is going to drift into complete irrelevancy. And I think that, uh, I think that the men at the head of this church are good men who are trying to do the best they can. And eventually not as quickly as I want to get there, but eventually we'll, we're going to get there. And we do have a lot of um, chatters who are appreciative of you being here, Jim. So I just, and I'm trying to like get a good mix going. Um, we still have two I hope more. Hope you've comments. seen some of those comments, Jim. No, I'm seeing them. They're very kind. They're very okay, kind. Good. All okay. right, and then so we've got two more callers, um, and then so callers, if we could just make it brief, um, put your question out, we can maybe do like what what Bill used to do, and um, and then just drop it and let uh, Jim uh, answer it. Okay, so all right, caller, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Perfect. Okay. You are, you are on. Do you want to give us a name we can call you by and then go ahead and ask Jim your question? Sure. I'll go by truth. Hi, so truth. Jim, I have a, uh, hello. I think what it really boils down to for me is either these individuals who represent themselves as prophets, seers and revelators and as the leaders and the mouthpieces of God on earth, that's actually real or it's not. So setting aside all of the human foibles and so forth, that, that's not really part of the, the salient point. The salient point is, do they speak for God or not? And can we rely on them or not? If so, great, then everything moves forward and we can rely on and put our trust and faith in that. Or if not, then there's some potentially uncomfortable results. When the 2015 policy came up, I was an experienced bishop. Um, and it was a hard thing for me to do. And as a key holder... I didn't really have options to, to do what, what you're suggesting that, that you've done as, as not a, a priesthood leader where you can say, well, you know, I'm going to kind of take that and maybe it is, maybe it's not. As a bishop, I needed to execute on that according to my priesthood leadership and the keys that I had. Okay, Truth, can I just break in here? Hey, Truth, uh, I just want to break in a second and see if I'm understanding you correctly. Are you saying that in November of 2015, when the policy of exclusion was leaked, that you were a bishop? Yes. Okay, please continue. And then three and a half years later, when the policy was rescinded, I was in the state presidency, a counselor to a key holder. So we sustain these men as prophets and revelators. We sustain the prophet as the only person on earth who possesses and is authorized to exercise all priesthood keys. Right. So as a key holder or a counselor to a key holder, there, there's not an option to say, well, did this really come from God or not? No, you, right. you, you do what you're, what you're told because it's not because they're men. It's because that's what God is saying to do. So it all boils down to that for me. So if you could just respond to that specific concern, um, then I'll listen in and thank you so much. Thank you, Truth. I'll go ahead and, and let you go. Uh, I think one of the only ways to survive in the church is to give up black and white thinking. And I think you're framing this in a black and white way that I would just re reject. Uh, because, because your answer, either they do or they don't. I'd say they do. And then you say, well, how can you say they do? Because blah, 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 blah. And I'd say, because I define do in a way differently than you do. I mean, I believe they receive inspiration from God. I believe they have authority from God. Uh, but I don't be think that means that uh, 
I mean, I mean, based on everything we've talked about here already tonight, I, 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 I prefer the word inspiration to revelation. And I believe inspiration is that God gives you a seed and how you act on it is, is the stewardship that you are given and you are judged on, right? I mean, you, 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 you get enough of a, a knowledge from God to know what the right thing to do is. And then God waits and sees what it is that you do. And that principle applies to prophets as well as to everybody else. But you're absolutely right. The structure of the church, you were in a stake presidency, you were a bishop. Uh, you do not have the luxury as a bishop to stand up and say, boy, I have a problem with this policy. I have a friend who was a bishop at the time who did exactly that, and he is no longer an active member of the church. Uh, that, that drove him out of the church. So I, your, your dilemma is a very, very real one. But uh, I would reject the binary I, 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 that, that either these guys are perfect, you know, not even perfect, inerrant, right, to use RFM's phrase. Either these guys are inerrant or they can't be trusted at all. They're completely wrong. And it's, I, I had a talk with, a, with an apologist who you would probably recognize if I use their name, but I don't want to do that. Uh, who said, you know, when people leave the church, very often they just switch jerseys. They are just as black and white when they leave. For, for the church could do no wrong. The prophet could do no wrong. And then when they leave, the prophet can do no right. The church is completely corrupt. Everything about it is evil and wrong and wicked. And uh, I, and I, I, I think there is way too much room between those two binaries. And that's that's where I live. So. Yeah, and I want to be clear that uh, and I think you understand this, that I'm not saying that everything that the prophets say is wrong. Maven's not saying that I've never heard Bill say that. But if we're living in this in-between place, in the gray area, which I think much more matches reality, where they're wrong about some things, maybe really wrong about some things, and other things they're right on, that that still gives us the same problem of how do we know what to follow and what not to follow. And I think the caller who went by truth was suggesting that especially when you're a bishop or in a state presidency and with the huge emphasis the church puts on of uh, following your file leader right that you just get in line if they jump you say how high and you don't give any pushback or any question you just do as you're told that that can create a problematic situation which is i think part and parcel of what you're talking about is the single greatest problem in the lds church is yeah. that fair to say I think that's fair to say. I do okay. think, you know, I've been in, I've never been a bishop. I've been in two bishop ricks. And it, it's interesting to me to note that uh, what happens in bishop brick meetings, um, there's a lot more pushback than what happens in public. And we've created a culture where, where no public disagreement is tolerated really at any level. I mean, you can't get a Relief Society president to stand up and say the bishop is full of beans. I mean, that doesn't happen. That's not allowed to happen. But Unless they're married. Unless they're married. But, but you can get a Relief Society president pushing against a bishop very hard in a ward council meeting. That does happen. And, and uh, to some degree, that's, that's almost encouraged. So, I mean, th there, there are seeds. What I'm saying is there are seeds and there are elements that show that it is possible. There is a route. It can happen. We can get there. We are not there. We are not anywhere close to there. But uh, I'm not willing to throw in the towel just yet. Jim, something happened in your screen. There's either a ghost behind you or you have a halo. Well, I'm being translated even as we speak. I've been bit so bit. righteous that I'm... Oh, that's my friend, one of the three Nephites that's showing up. I don't know what that is. Yeah, would you tell him I've got a problem with my car? I'd like yeah. a little help. Yeah, I, mean, I don't understand why the three Nephites have nothing better to do than to fix flat tires. I would think well, they're good at it because practice makes perfect. I'm sorry, Maven, what? Should we go to our – we have one more caller. Are we ready? Let's or... do that. Okay. All right. I can go on forever. I love this. I hope it's a, I hope it's a woman. We've had a long line of guys, nothing but guys as far as the eye can see, out to the crack of doom. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll see. Go ahead, caller. You're on. Hi, RFM. I am a woman and I'm very good looking too. Are you single? I can hear that you're good looking. Okay, let's go back to the guys. Oh. No, I'm okay. kidding. Who, wh Sorry, what's I'm your name or who, what do you want to go by? Uh, uh, Cultural Hall. Jim probably knows. Oh, hi. Cultural Hall! Hey, buddy! It's another guy. 
Let's, uh, this guy is awesome. This, this, this guy is just to chat with you. Oh my What's God. What's your name again? I forget. Cultural Hall. What's he, that? He's got Cultural quite the TikTok. Yeah. Oh, your I, name is Cultural Hall? This guy yeah. is hysterical. This guy is on sure. Twitter. And and uh, we, we've exchanged messages back and forth. But uh, he is so stinking funny. Uh, okay, I'm already envious. And he's and he's delightful. He's he, he's looks just, everything, right, RFM? Maybe I... Hey, knock it off, pal. <laughs> Cultural kind of Hall said he'd give me a you gift card. Funny. If I, Maybe if I, I will go out with you. Cultural Hall. Do you do the Cultural Hall podcast? Is there a Cultural Hall podcast? No, they, yeah. they actually mistook me for them one time, and that was a funny thing. Oh. oh, okay. After the copyright infringement lawsuit was over, it was probably really funny. Uh, we we are Correct. united, yeah. Cultural Hall and I, in in torturing Desnat. Desnat hates me as Yo. much more than most most yeah. uh, Exmos, and and Cultural Hall tweaks them better than that. anybody. Okay, Cultural Hall, I'm sorry. I've been interrupting I'm a, you I'm a Desnat ceaselessly. But you better get used to it if we're going to be in any kind okay, of a relationship. I, I, no so problem. go ahead, Cultural Hall. What did you, did you have a question for Jim? I don't even have a serious. Uh, I just wanted to say Jim's cool. I, I think it's awesome he came on. He took a lot of crap from people. I know he's got to walk a tight line, and I think he did it as best he could and came off pretty well. But I have a really hard question for you guys, and it's have you guys – purchased any of Kwaku's supplements and if so are you ripped have we purchased any of Kwaku's what supplements supplements, supplements. I, I keep trying to buy them from him but he keeps uh oh my gosh I was going to say something that really I'm really glad I just stopped myself oh I do have an internal voice and every now and then I listen to it uh Kwaku is the, the of the three midnight Mormons Probably. he's the one I actually know the least I've had the least amount of conversations with him but I've got no problem with Kwaku. People start dumping on Kwaku and he's okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so and hopefully he's out of the asylum by now. Well, uh, I don't want to go there. Cultural Hall, it's fun to hear your voice. Nice to meet you. I just think you are delightful. Yeah, man, I'm a real person. Yeah. Yes, Thanks. you are. I'll make it out to you, I'll take you up on that lunch. All right. I'd love it. Love it. You're wow, Florida, this is though, great. Right? Thank you. Thanks, Cultural Hall. I think this could be the start of a beautiful friendship. Cultural Hall is 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 very much an ex member of the church, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. This, I mean, uh, some of his memes would would if I, if I were to retweet them, I'd be I'd be I'd be called up for discipline to some degree. Wow. But okay, Jim or Maven or anybody in the so audience. Funny. He's so funny. Anyway, I could tell. I think we had this really good thing going on, this huge vibe. I'm looking forward to pursuing that relationship. But can anybody here in the audience complete this little poem? One flew east, one flew west. What comes next? I'm, I'm watching the comments. <laughs> General comments. One flew east, yes. one flew west, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Oh, there you go. Oh. So that's all I'm going to say about Quaku. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, right. I swear, I think he, he thinks he's Jack Nicholson or something. Uh, you're talking about my future son-in-law, remember, according to Kwaku. By the way, is your daughter's name Elizabeth? No, it's Eliza. I, oh, didn't you name any of your daughters Elizabeth? No, but Eliza is uh, Eliza Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. I mean, Elizabeth Bennett goes by Eliza a lot in Pride and Prejudice. We didn't actually oh, okay. mean to uh, um, mean to connect them. I I can't read Pride and Prejudice because they spell Bennett with one T, and it drives me freaking crazy. It's it just it's like this isn't Bennett. This is this is this is a pseudo Bennett. This doesn't work. And playing the role of Mister Darcy will be Quaku L. No, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to crap on Quaku. Oh, I'm not asking you to crap on him. All right. Well, he'd be good, Mr. Darcy. He's he's a he's a he's a pretty competent actor, isn't he? He's done some. Oh, movies. he's he's Shakespearean. Uh, I'm a Shakespearean actor. I'm a trained. I've never seen a better actor than Quaku L. No. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> not going there. Not taking the bait. I am trying to be as complimentary as I can be. I am so misunderstood. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything to say. I I feel like this is where maybe Bill would be stronger, and he would he would have something clever to wrap up with. Well, may I, with, may I just say that I really and just start strangling me. May, I I just want to say how much I appreciate you having me on this, and how much I enjoy doing this. The, this is so much fun, and I think you guys are really delightful. And and I just I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to rub shoulders with you and talk about fun, interesting things. That is very gracious of you, Jim. And, you know, I want to echo a lot of the sentiments that have been up here on the screen, which is that you are a great guy. You're a nice guy. And the thing I appreciate about you so much is your authenticity, your realness and your willingness to discuss these difficult issues and even take some difficult questions. So I really appreciate that. I think if there were more people like you, and if you can set this example for others to do the same, like Daniel Peterson or Stephen Smoot, that uh, this would I be- I referenced Stephen Smoot earlier and you didn't notice. No, what did you say? Did you say Bukake? I keep... <laughs> you know that's his middle name, don't you? Stephen Bukake Smoot. It is You not. had heard that. It you is on his birth certificate. I'm not kidding. Get his birth certificate. No, I, I, I quite. I don't like know what his parents were thinking, but you know, I quite like Daniel. What Peterson. we're saying was we're we're also really glad that you're coming on for these kinds of shows, Jim, as well. We really do think the church would be better um, if uh, if more members were like you. So, well, I'll try not to get too swole ahead, but uh, that's very very kind of you. But uh, I appreciate the fact that you are both still engaged and still asking hard questions and still. How did you know we were engaged? I, well, that's the rumor. Quaker told me. <laughs> He's performing the wedding, I thought. Oh, well, I guess we should come out with it now, Maven. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> I would maybe show up just to like, just to see it happen. You know, it, that would be funny. There you go. That would be well, quite. We better sign off. Though. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. We better sign up before you really get in trouble. Oh, it says Jim blushing is too funny. Am I blushing? Blushing? I couldn't tell. I'm hey, very, very know. pale. So if I blush, it's very obvious. Yeah. And maybe you have been a little, but that's good for you. So that's good for you. We're going to have to wrap it up now. And Thanks besides, everyone. which I think you probably got at least one message uh, on your voice mail from your bishop and another from your state president that you're going to need to be responding to after the show's over. Sounds delightful. I wish you luck with that. And thanks for coming on the show, Jim Bennett. You are a mensch. You are a mensch, sir. Appreciate this. Maven, very nice to, to get to know you a little bit.